part one of book one of on the laws by marcus tullius cicero translated by charles duke young part one of book one marcus tullius cicero has composed this treatise in the form of a dialogue in which himself his brother quintus and atticus are the interlocutors cicero supposes this dialogue to take place near his villa at arpinum on the banks of the river liris and beneath the shade of a grove in the midst of which grew an ancient oak the sight of this tree reminds atticus of the oak which cicero had described in a poem which he once composed in honour of marius from this circumstance he takes occasion to compliment cicero on his poetry the conversation then turns upon history and quintus observes that he knew no one better able than his brother to write the history of his country and presses him to undertake it this cicero declines and turns the discourse to the subject of universal justice and the law of nature and nations atticus i recognize this as the very grove and this oak too as the oak of arpinum the description of which i have often read in your poem on marius if that oak still exists this must certainly be it and indeed it appears extremely old quintus cicero yes my atticus it does exist and always will exist for it is a nursling of genius no such long-lived stock can be planted by the care of the agriculturalist as may be sown by the verse of the poet atticus how can that happen my quintus and what sort of seed is that which poets can sow for you seem to me in eulogizing your brother to be putting in a word for yourself quintus you may say that if you please but as long as the latin language is spoken an oak which will be called marius's oak will never be wanting in this place and as sivola said of my brother's poem on marius it will quote, extend its hoary age through countless years Close quote. unless indeed you believe that your athenians have been able really to preserve the olive in their citadel free from death or that tall and slender palm tree which the people of delos show to this day is the same which homer's ulysses says that he had beheld at delos and there are many other things in many places the memorial of which endures beyond the term of any possible natural existence this acorn-bearing oak then out of which there once did fly quote, jove's golden eagle dazzling as the sun close quote, is at present the genuine tree but when storms and the lapse of ages shall have wasted it there will still be found an oak on this sacred spot which will be called the oak of marius atticus i do not doubt it but there is one question which i would ask not of you but of the poet marcus himself whether the tree is indebted for its celebrity to his verses alone or whether the circumstance which they record really happened in the history of marius marcus cicero i will answer you frankly but not till you have first informed me what do you think of the tradition which asserts that not far from your house at rome proculus julius beheld our first king romulus walking after his decease and that romulus told him that he had become a god and that his name was quirinus and he ordered a temple to be dedicated to him on that spot tell me also what you think of the tradition of the athenians who maintain that not far from your athenian villa boreas made a stolen match with orithia for so runs the story atticus for what purpose do you ask me such questions as these 
marcus for no purpose at all unless it be to convince you that we had better not inquire too critically into those remarkable accounts which have been thus handed down by tradition atticus but there are many statements in your marius which are the subjects of inquiry as to whether they are true or false and some people expect the strictest accuracy from you because the events of which you speak are fresh in men's memory and because you are speaking of one who like yourself was a native of arpinum marcus i myself also should be unwilling to gain the reputation of a liar but yet some of these inquisitors my atticus show great ignorance of the subject who expect an exact statement of matters of fact in a work of this nature as if the author were not a poet but a witness and yet i doubt not that these critics really believe that numa did converse with egeria and that the eagle did really replace his cap on the head of the first tarquin quintus i understand you my brother you think that the laws which ought to bind a historian are quite different from those which require to be observed in a poem marcus certainly inasmuch as the main object of the former is truth in all its relations while that of the latter is amusement although in herodotus the father of greek history and in theopompus we find fables in great numbers atticus i have now found the opportunity which i wanted and i shall not let it slip marcus what opportunity atticus atticus men have long ago asked or rather implored you to write a history for they conceive that if you undertook this literary enterprise the result would be that even in the historical department we should be nowise inferior to greece and if you will listen to my opinion it seems to me that you owe this gift not only to the affection of those who are delighted with literature but to your country too in order that since you have saved her you should endeavour likewise to adorn her for a good history is a desideratum in our national literature as i know by my own experience and as i have often heard you declare now there is no man more likely than yourself to give general satisfaction in a work of this kind since by your own avowal it is of all the forms of composition that which most demands the eloquence of the orator wherefore i entreat you undertake this work and devote your time to this employment which has been hitherto unknown to our fellow-citizens or at least neglected by them for after the annals of the chief pontiffs than which nothing can be more interesting we come to the book of fabius or of cato whom you are always eulogizing or to the treatises of piso fanius and venonius though perhaps one of them may be more vigorous than another still are they not all extremely defective the contemporary of fanius coelius antipater adopted a bolder style of expression he had indeed some energy was rude and rough without much polish or skill but he served as a sort of warning to his successors to write with more accuracy and eloquence but unfortunately he had for his successors a gellius a claudius and a Celio, who far from improving on him relapsed into the dullness and insipidity of earlier writers i scarcely need to mention attius his garrulity is not without neatness though he has derived it not so much from the learned grecian authors as from the petty latin scribblers in his style he is prolix and full of conceits which he indulges in the most shameless manner his friend sisena far surpasses all our historical writers unless there be any whose compositions have not yet been published and of whom we cannot judge he however has never gained a name as an orator among those of your rank 
and in his history he betrays a sort of puerility. He seems to have read no Greek author but Clitarchus, and he is content to imitate him. But even if he were to succeed in his imitation, he would still be far enough from the best style. Therefore the task of historian of right belongs to you, and we shall expect you to accomplish it, unless Quintus can bring forward any reasonable objections. Quintus, I have nothing to say against it. Indeed, we have often talked over the subject together, and I have made the same request as yourself, but there is a slight disagreement between us on the subject. Atticus, how so? Quintus, why, respecting the epoch from whence he should commence his history, for, in my opinion, he ought to go back to the most distant ages, since the accounts that have hitherto been published respecting those times are so written as never to be read. But he himself, on the other hand, wishes to confine himself to the events that have happened within the recollection of his own age, so as only to describe those public affairs in which he himself bore a part. Atticus. In this respect I rather agree with him, for the grandest events in Roman history are probably those that have taken place within our own recollection, and then too he will be able to illustrate the praises of our noble friend Pompey, and describe the memorable year of his own consulship, which I would much rather have related by him than anything about Romulus and Remus, as the saying is. Marcus, I know, my Atticus, that you and other friends have long urged me to this undertaking, nor should I be at all unwilling to attempt it if I could find any free and leisure time. But it is vain to enter on so extensive a work while my mind is harassed with cares, and my hands are full of business. Such an undertaking requires a perfect freedom from care and political business. Atticus, what can you mean? What leisure time did you ever find for those other works of which you have written more than any other of our Roman authors? Marcus, why, certain spare times occur to every man, and these I make a rule not to lose. For instance, if I spend a few days in rusticating at my country seat, I employ them in composing a part of those essays which I may have determined to write. But an historical work cannot be begun at all unless one has leisure time prepared beforehand, nor can it be completed in a short time. And my mind is thrown into a miserable state of suspense when, after having fairly commenced some work, I am drawn away in some other direction, nor do I find it as easy to recover the train of ideas in work so interrupted, as to bring works when begun at once to a conclusion. Atticus, your argument then would show that you require an appointment as ambassador, or some similar free and unoccupied holiday for your purpose. Marcus, I would rather trust to the holiday to which I am entitled by my age, especially as I do not refuse, after the method of our ancestors, to continue the custom of giving magisterial advice to my clients, and thus to discharge the offices of old age gracefully and honorably. And in such a situation I should be able to give as much time as I might choose, not only to the work which you require, but to others still more extensive and important. Atticus. I fear that few will accept such an apology for your retirement, and that you will be obliged to speak in public as long as you live. And I regret this the more, as you have already changed your manner of delivery, and have instituted another style of eloquence, so that as your friend Roscius, the actor, in his old age, was forced to give up his most brilliant modulations, and to adapt the instrumental accompaniments to a slower measure, so you also, my Cicero, find it necessary, daily, 
to relax from those lofty conflicts of oratory to which you have been accustomed so that your eloquence is already not much removed from the gentle conversation of philosophers and since the extremest old age is still capable of undergoing that amount of exertion i see that your retirement will never be allowed to excuse you from pleading causes quintus but i indeed think that the citizens of rome might be induced to sanction your retirement from public life if you still consented to plead in legal matters so whenever you please i think you ought to try marcus your advice my quintus would be excellent if there were no danger in taking such a step but i fear that in thus seeking to diminish my labours i should rather increase them and that i might find that i had united to the toil of public causes and prosecutions which i never attempt to plead without full preparation and meditation the addition of this professional interpretation of the laws which would not distress me so much by its labour as by its tendency to deprive me of that time for deliberation as to what i should speak without which i never ventured to enter on any considerable pleadings atticus why should you not then in this spare time as you call it at present explain these very points to us and write us a treatise on the civil law with more accuracy than others have hitherto employed for even from your earliest youth i remember that you used to study the laws when i used to go like yourself to hear the lectures of Sivala, nor did i ever find you so addicted to oratorical pursuits as to neglect your legal studies marcus you seek to engage me in a long discussion my atticus however i will not hesitate to undertake it unless quintus prefers some other subject if not i will tell you all i know about it since at present we seem to be at leisure quintus i shall listen to you with the greatest pleasure for what better subject can be discussed or how can the day be spent more profitably marcus let us go then to our accustomed promenade and to the benches where after we have had walking enough we may lie down nor shall we want for entertainment while asking different questions of one another atticus let us go then and enter on our investigations as we walk along the bank of the river under the shadow of its foliage and now begin i beg of you to explain to us your opinion respecting the nature of civil law marcus my opinion why that we have had many great men in rome who have made it their profession to expound it to the people and explain its doctrines and practice but though they professed to be acquainted with its great principles they were in reality familiar rather with its minuter technicalities for what can be grander or nobler than the jurisprudence of a state or what can be so insignificant as the office of those men who are consulted as advocates necessary as it is for the people not that i think that those who adopt this profession have been altogether ignorant of the principles of universal legislation but they have united their practice of this civil law as they call it to just so much as gives them a hold on the interests of the people but the great principles of jurisprudence are unknown and less necessary in practice what then is it that you invite me to or what are you exhorting me to to write treatises on the rights of common sewers and partition walls or to compose formulas of stipulations and judgments these have been already most diligently prepared by many persons and are lower than the topics which i suppose you expect me to discuss atticus but if you ask what i expect i should reply that after having given us a treatise on the commonwealth it appears a natural consequence that you should also write one on the laws for this is what i see was done 
by your illustrious favourite plato the philosopher whom you admire and prefer to all others and love with an especial affection marcus do you wish then that as he conversed at crete with cleinias and megalos of lacedaemon on that summer's day as he describes it in the cypress groves and sylvan avenues of gnosis often objecting to and at times approving of the established laws and customs of commonwealths and discussed what were the best laws so we also walking beneath these lofty poplars along these green and umbrageous banks and sometimes sitting down should investigate the same subjects somewhat more copiously than is required by the practice of the courts of law atticus i should like to hear such a discussion marcus but what says quintus quintus there is no subject which i would rather hear argued marcus and you are quite right for take my word for it in no kind of discussion can it be more advantageously displayed how much has been bestowed upon man by nature and how great a capacity for the noblest enterprises is implanted in the mind of man for the sake of cultivating and perfecting which we were born and sent into the world and what beautiful association what natural fellowship binds men together by reciprocal charities and when we have explained these grand and universal principles of morals then the true fountain of laws and rights can be discovered atticus in your opinion then it is not in the edict of the magistrate as the majority of our modern lawyers pretend nor in the twelve tables as the ancients maintained but in the sublimest doctrines of philosophy that we must seek for the true source and obligation of jurisprudence marcus for in this discussion of ours my atticus we are not inquiring how we may take proper caution in law or what we are to answer in each consultation that may indeed be an important affair as in truth it is and at one time it was supported by many great men and is at present expounded by one most eminent lawyer with admirable ability and skill but the whole subject of universal law and jurisprudence must be comprehended in this discussion in order that this which we call civil law may be confined in some one small and narrow space of nature for we shall have to explain the true nature of moral justice which must be traced back from the nature of man and laws will have to be considered by which all political states should be governed and last of all shall we have to speak of those laws and customs of nations which are framed for the use and convenience of particular countries in which even our own people will not be omitted which are known by the title of civil laws quintus you take a noble view of the subject my brother and go to the fountain-head in order to throw light on the subject of our consideration and those who treat civil law in any other manner are not so much pointing out the paths of justice as those of litigation marcus that is not quite the case my quintus it is not so much the science of law that produces litigation as the ignorance of it but more of this by and by at present let us examine the first principles of right now many learned men have maintained that it springs from law i hardly know if their opinion be not correct at least according to their own definition for law say they is the highest reason implanted in nature which prescribes those things which ought to be done and forbids the contrary and when this same reason is confirmed and established in men's minds it is then law they therefore conceive that prudence is a law whose operation is to urge us to good actions and restrain us from evil ones and they think too that the greek name for law nomos which is derived from nemo to distribute 
implies the very nature of the thing that is to give every man his due the latin name lex conveys the idea of selection a legendos according to the greeks therefore the name of law implies an equitable distribution according to the romans an equitable selection and indeed both characteristics belong peculiarly to law and if this be a correct statement which it seems to me for the most part to be then the origin of right is to be sought in the law for this is the true energy of nature this is the very soul and reason of a wise man and the test of virtue and vice but since all this discussion of ours relates to a subject the terms of which are of frequent occurrence in the popular language of the citizens we shall be sometimes obliged to use the same terms as the vulgar and to call that law which in its written enactments sanctions what it thinks fit by special commands or prohibitions let us begin then to establish the principles of justice on that supreme law which has existed from all ages before any legislative enactments were drawn up in writing or any political governments constituted quintus that will be more convenient and more sensible with reference to the subject of the discussion which we have determined on marcus shall we then seek for the origin of justice at its fountain-head when we have discovered which we shall be in no doubt to what these questions which we are examining ought to be referred quintus such is the course i would advise atticus i also subscribe to your brother's opinion marcus since then we wish to maintain and preserve the constitution of that republic which scipio in those six books which i have written under that title has proved to be the best and since all our laws are to be accommodated to the kind of political government there described we must also treat of the general principles of morals and manners and not limit ourselves on all occasions to written laws but i purpose to trace back the origin of right from nature itself who will be our best guide in conducting the whole discussion atticus you will do right and when she is our guide it is absolutely impossible for us to err marcus do you then grant my atticus for i know my brother's opinion already that the entire universe is regulated by the power of the immortal gods that by their nature reason energy mind divinity or some other word of clearer signification if there be such all things are governed and directed for if you will not grant me this that is what i must begin by establishing atticus i grant you all you can desire but owing to this singing of birds and babbling of waters i fear my fellow learners can scarcely hear me marcus you are quite right to be on your guard for even the best men occasionally fall into a passion and they will be very indignant if they hear you denying the first article of that notable book entitled quote, the chief doctrines of epicurus close quote, in which he says quote, that god takes care of nothing neither of himself nor of any other being close quote. atticus pray proceed for i am waiting to know what advantage you mean to take of the concession i have made you marcus i will not detain you long this is the bearing which they have on our subject this animal prescient sagacious complex acute full of memory reason and counsel which we call man has been generated by the supreme god in a most transcendent condition for he is the only creature among all the races and descriptions of animated beings who is endued with superior reason and thought in which the rest are deficient and what is there i do not say in man alone 
but in all heaven and earth more divine than reason which when it becomes right and perfect is justly termed wisdom there exists therefore since nothing is better than reason and since this is the common property of god and man a certain aboriginal rational intercourse between divine and human natures but where reason is common there right reason must also be common to the same parties and since this right reason is what we call law god and men must be considered as associated by law again there must also be a communion of right where there is a communion of law and those who have law and right thus in common must be considered members of the same commonwealth and if they are obedient to the same rule and the same authority they are even much more so to this one celestial regency this divine mind and omnipotent deity so that the entire universe may be looked upon as forming one vast commonwealth of gods and men and as in earthly states certain ranks are distinguished with reference to the relationships of families according to a certain principle which will be discussed in its proper place that principle in the nature of things is far more magnificent and splendid by which men are connected with the gods as belonging to their kindred and nation for when we are reasoning on universal nature we are accustomed to argue and indeed the truth is just as it is stated in that argument that in the long course of ages and the uninterrupted succession of celestial revolutions there arrived a certain ripe time for the sowing of the human race and when it was sown and scattered over the earth it was animated by the divine gift of souls and as men retained from their terrestrial origin those other particulars by which they cohere together which are frail and perishable their immortal spirits were ingenerated by the deity from which circumstance it may be truly said that we possess a certain consanguinity and kindred and fellowship with the heavenly powers and among all the varieties of animals there is not one except man which retains any idea of the divinity and among men themselves there is no nation so savage and ferocious as not to admit the necessity of believing in a god however ignorant they may be what sort of god they ought to believe in from whence we conclude that every man must recognize a deity who has any recollection and knowledge of his own origin now the law of virtue is the same in god and man and in no other disposition besides them this virtue is nothing else than a nature perfect in itself and wrought up to the most consummate excellence there exists therefore a similitude between god and man and as this is the case what connection can there be which concerns us more nearly and is more certain therefore nature has supplied such an abundance of supplies suited to the convenience and use of men that the things which are thus produced appear to be designedly bestowed on us and not fortuitous productions nor does this observation apply only to the fruits and vegetables which gush from the bosom of the earth but likewise to cattle and the beasts of the field some of which it is clear were intended for the use of mankind others for propagation and others for the food of man innumerable arts have likewise been discovered by the teaching of nature whom reason has imitated and thus skilfully discovered all things necessary to the happiness of life with respect to man this same bountiful nature hath not merely allotted him a subtle and active spirit but also physical senses like so many servants and messengers and she has laid bare before him the obscure but necessary explanation of many things which are as it were the foundation of practical knowledge and in all respects she has given him a convenient figure of body suited to the bent of the human character 
for while she has kept down the countenances of other animals and fixed their eyes on their food she has bestowed on man alone an erect stature and prompted him to the contemplation of heaven the ancient home of his kindred immortals so exquisitely too has she fashioned the features of the human face as to make them indicate the most recondite thoughts and sentiments for our eloquent eyes speak forth every impulse and passion of our souls and that which we call expression which cannot exist in any other animal but man betrays all our feelings the power of which was well known to the greeks though they have no name for it i will not enlarge on the wonderful faculties and qualities of the rest of the body the modulation of the voice and the power of oratory which is the greatest instrument of influence upon human society for these matters do not all belong to the present occasion or the present subject and i think that scipio has already sufficiently explained them in those books of mine which you have read since then the deity has been pleased to create and adorn man to be the chief and president of all terrestrial creatures so it is evident without further argument that human nature has also made very great advances by its own intrinsic energy that nature which without any other instruction than her own has developed the first rude principles of the understanding and strengthened and perfected reason to all the appliances of science and art end of part one of book one part two of book one of on the laws by marcus tullius cicero translated by charles duke young atticus o oh, ye immortal gods to what a distance back are you tracing the principles of justice however you are discoursing in such a style that i will not show any impatience to hear what i expect you to say on the civil law but i will listen patiently even if you spend the whole day in this kind of discourse for assuredly these which perhaps you are embracing in your argument for the sake of others are grander topics than even the subject itself for which they prepare the way marcus you may well describe these topics as grand which we are now briefly discussing but of all the questions which are ever the subject of discussion among learned men there is none which it is more important thoroughly to understand than this that man is born for justice and that law and equity have not been established by opinion but by nature this truth will become still more apparent if we investigate the nature of human association and society for there is no one thing so like or so equal to another as in every instance man is to man and if the corruption of customs and the variation of opinions did not induce an imbecility of minds and turn them aside from the course of nature no one would more nearly resemble himself than all men would resemble all men therefore whatever definition we give of man will be applicable to the whole human race and this is a good argument that there is no dissimilarity of kind among men because if this were the case one definition could not include all men in fact reason which alone gives us so many advantages over beasts by means of which we conjecture argue refute discourse and accomplish and conclude our designs is assuredly common to all men for the faculty of acquiring knowledge is similar in all human minds though the knowledge itself may be endlessly diversified by the same senses we all perceive the same objects and those things which move the senses at all do move in the same way the senses of all men and those first rude elements of intelligence which as i before observed are the earliest developments of thought are similarly impressed upon all men 
and that faculty of speech which is the interpreter of the mind agrees in the ideas which it conveys though it may differ in the words by which it expresses them and therefore there exists not a man in any nation who if he adopts nature for his guide may not arrive at virtue nor is this resemblance which all men bear to each other remarkable in those things only which are in accordance with right reason but also in errors for all men alike are captivated by pleasure which although it is a temptation to what is disgraceful nevertheless bears some resemblance to natural good for as by its delicacy and sweetness it is delightful it is through a mistake of the intellect adopted as something salutary and by an error scarcely less universal we shun death as if it were a dissolution of nature and cling to life because it keeps us in that existence in which we were born thus likewise we consider pain as one of the greatest evils not only on account of its present asperity but also because it seems the precursor of mortality again on account of the apparent resemblance between renown with honour those men appear to us happy who are honoured and miserable who happen to be inglorious in like manner our minds are all similarly susceptible of inquietudes joys desires and fears nor if different men have different opinions does it follow that those who deify dogs and cats do not labour under superstition equally with other nations though they may differ from them in the forms of its manifestation again what nation is there which has not a regard for kindness benignity gratitude and mindfulness of benefits what nation is there in which arrogance malice cruelty and unthankfulness are not reprobated and detested and while this uniformity of opinions proves that the whole race of mankind is united together the last point is that a system of living properly makes men better if what i have said meets your approbation i will proceed or if any doubts occur to you we had better clear them up first atticus there is nothing which strikes us if i may reply for both of us marcus it follows then that nature made us just that we might share our goods with each other and supply each other's wants you observe in this discussion whenever i speak of nature i mean nature in its genuine purity but that there is in fact such corruption engendered by evil customs that the sparks as it were of virtue which have been given by nature are extinguished and that antagonist vices arise around it and become strengthened but if as nature prompts them to men would with deliberate judgment in the words of the poet quote, being men think nothing that concerns mankind indifferent to them close quote, then would justice be cultivated equally by all for to those to whom nature has given reason she has also given right reason and therefore also law which is nothing else than right reason enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil and if nature has given us law she hath also given us right but she has bestowed reason on all therefore right has been bestowed on all and therefore did socrates deservedly execrate the man who first drew a distinction between utility and nature for he used to complain that this error was the source of all human vices to which this sentence of pythagoras refers quote, the things belonging to friends are common close quote, and that other quote, friendly equality close quote. from whence it appears that when a wise man has displayed this benevolence which is so extensively and widely diffused towards one who is endowed with equal virtue then that phenomenon takes place 
which is altogether incredible to some people but which is a necessary consequence that he loves himself not more dearly than he loves his friend for how can a difference of interests arise where all interests are similar if there could be ever so minute a difference of interests then there would be an end of even the nature of friendship the real meaning of which is such that there is no friendship at all the moment that a person prefers anything happening to himself rather than to his friend now these preliminary remarks have been put forward as a preparation for the rest of our discourse and argument in order that you may more easily understand that nature herself is the foundation of justice and when i have explained this a little more at large then i will proceed to the consideration of that civil law from which all these arguments of mine are derived quintus then you have not much to add my brother for the arguments you have already used have sufficiently proved to atticus or at all events to me that nature is the fountain of justice atticus how could i maintain any other opinion since you have now established these points first that we have been provided as we are and adorned by the gifts of the gods secondly that all mankind have but one similar and common principle of living together and lastly that all men are bound together by a certain natural indulgence and affection as well as social rights and as we have rightly as i think admitted the truth of these principles how can we with any consistency separate from nature that law and justice which are her moral developments marcus you are quite right and that is the proper view of the case but in conformity with the method of philosophers i do not mean the older sages of philosophy but those modern ones who have erected a magazine as it were of wisdom those questions which were formerly discussed loosely and unconstrainedly are now examined with strictness and distinctness nor will these men allow that we have done justice to the subject which we have now before us unless we demonstrate in a distinct discussion that right is a part of nature atticus you seem to have renounced your liberty in debate my cicero or are you become a man who in discussion rather follows the authority of others than develops his individual sentiments marcus not always atticus but you see what the line of this present conversation is and how the main object of this whole discussion is to strengthen the foundation of commonwealths to establish their forces and to benefit their population i am therefore particularly anxious to avoid arguments which have not been thoroughly examined and carefully considered not that i expect to demonstrate my doctrine to the satisfaction of all men for that is impossible but i hope to do so to that of those who think that all just and honourable things deserve to be cultivated even for their own sake and that nothing whatever can be properly called a good which is not intrinsically praiseworthy or at least that there can exist no great good whatever which is truly laudable on its own account all the philosophers who flourished in the old academy with speusippus xenocrates and polemon or those that followed aristotle and theophrastus agreeing with them in doctrine though they might differ in their method of explaining it whether like zeno they preserved the same principles while they changed the terms of exposition or whether like ariston they supported that difficult and arduous sect now generally scattered and confuted which supposed that with the exception of virtue and vice all other things were completely equal and indifferent all these have adopted the principles which i have been explaining but those who indulge their appetites and pamper their passions and who estimate all the objects of their pursuit or avoidance in life by pleasure and pain even if they speak truth 
for there is no need of raising the question here we may still desire to be content with talking in their own gardens and entreat them to retire for a while from all connection with the state of which they know nothing and have never wished to know anything as to that new academy of which arcesilas and carneades are the leaders and who attack all sects and parties we will implore them not to interrupt us in our present discussion for if they enter upon these subjects which to us appear to be settled and arranged with sufficient accuracy and learning they will do great mischief but i would rather pacify them and do not dare to order them off for in questions of this nature we have made expiation without such fumigations as theirs but there is no expiation for the crimes and impieties of men the guilty therefore must pay the penalty and bear the punishment not so much those punishments inflicted by courts of justice which were not always in being do not exist at present in many places and even where established are frequently biased and partial but those of conscience while the furies pursue and torment them not with burning torches as the poets feign but with remorse of conscience and the tortures arising from guilt but were it the fear of punishment and not the nature of the thing itself that ought to restrain mankind from wickedness what i would ask could give villains the least uneasiness abstracting from all fears of this kind and yet none of them was ever so audaciously impudent but what he either denied that the action in question had been committed by him or pretended some cause or other for his just indignation or sought a defence of his deed in some right of nature and if the wicked dare to appeal to this principle with what respect ought not good men to treat them but if either direct punishment or the fear of it be what deters men from a vicious and criminal course of life and not the turpitude of the thing itself then none can be guilty of injustice and the greatest offenders ought rather to be called imprudent than wicked on the other hand those among us who are determined to the practice of goodness not by its own intrinsic excellence but for the sake of some private advantage are cunning rather than good men for what will not that man do in the dark who fears nothing but a witness and a judge should he meet a solitary individual in a desert place whom he can rob of a large sum of money and altogether unable to defend himself from being robbed how will he behave in such a case our man who is just and honourable from principle and the nature of the thing itself will converse with the stranger assist him and show him the way but he who does nothing for the sake of another and measures everything by the advantage it brings to itself it is obvious i suppose how such a one will act and should he deny that he would kill the man or rob him of his treasure his reason for this cannot be that he apprehends there is any moral turpitude in such actions but only because he is afraid of a discovery that is to say that bad consequences will thence ensue a sentiment this at which not only learned men but even clowns must blush it is therefore an absurd extravagance in some philosophers to assert that all things are necessarily just which are established by the civil laws and the institutions of nations are then the laws of tyrants just simply because they are laws suppose the thirty tyrants of athens had imposed certain laws on the athenians or suppose again that these athenians were delighted with these tyrannical laws would these laws on that account have been considered just 
for my own part i do not think such laws deserve any greater estimation than that passed during our own interregnum which ordained that the dictator should be empowered to put to death with impunity whatever citizens he pleased without hearing them in their own defence for there is but one essential justice which cements society and one law which establishes this justice this law is right reason which is the true rule of all commandments and prohibitions whoever neglects this law whether written or unwritten is necessarily unjust and wicked but if justice consists in submission to written laws and national customs and if as the same school affirms everything must be measured by utility alone he who thinks that such conduct will be advantageous to him will neglect the laws and break them if it is in his power and the consequence is that real justice has really no existence if it have not one by nature and if that which is established as such on account of utility is overturned by some other utility but if nature does not ratify law then all the virtues may lose their sway for what becomes of generosity patriotism or friendship where will the desire of benefiting our neighbours or the gratitude that acknowledges kindness be able to exist at all for all these virtues proceed from our natural inclination to love mankind and this is the true basis of justice and without this not only the mutual charities of men but the religious services of the gods would be at an end for these are preserved as i imagine rather by the natural sympathy which subsists between divine and human beings than by mere fear and timidity but if the will of the people the decrees of the senate the adjudications of magistrates were sufficient to establish rights then it might become right to rob right to commit adultery right to substitute forged wills if such conduct were sanctioned by the votes or decrees of the multitude but if the opinions and suffrages of foolish men had sufficient weight to outbalance the nature of things then why should they not determine among them that what is essentially bad and pernicious should henceforth pass for good and beneficial or why since law can make right out of injustice should it not also be able to change evil into good but we have no other rule by which we may be capable of distinguishing between a good or a bad law than that of nature nor is it only right and wrong which are discriminated by nature but generally all that is honourable is by this means distinguished from all that is shameful for common sense has impressed in our minds the first principles of things and has given us a general acquaintance with them by which we connect with virtue every honourable quality and with vice all that is disgraceful but to think that these differences exist only in opinion and not in nature is the part of an idiot for even the virtue of a tree or a horse in which expression there is an abuse of terms does not exist in our opinion only but in nature and if that is the case then what is honourable and disgraceful must also be discriminated by nature for if opinion could determine respecting the character of universal virtue it might also decide respecting particular or partial virtues but who will dare to determine that a man is prudent and cautious not from his general conduct but from some external appearances for virtue evidently consists in perfect reason and this certainly resides in nature therefore so does all honour and honesty in the same way for as what is true and false creditable and discreditable 
is judged of rather by their essential qualities than their external relations so the consistent and perpetual course of life which is virtue and the inconsistency of life which is vice are judged of according to their own nature and that inconstancy must necessarily be vicious we form an estimate of the opinions of youths but not by their opinions those virtues and vices which reside in their moral natures must not be measured by opinions and so of all moral qualities we must discriminate between honourable and dishonourable by reference to the essential nature of the things themselves the good we commend must needs contain in itself some thing commendable for as i before stated goodness is not a mode of opinion but of nature for if it were otherwise opinion alone might constitute virtue and happiness which is the most absurd of suppositions and since we judge of good and evil by their nature and since good and evil are the first principles of nature certainly we should judge in the same manner of all honourable and all shameful things referring them all to the law of nature but we are often too much disturbed by the dissensions of men and the variation of opinions and because the same thing does not happen with reference to our senses we look upon them as certain by nature those objects indeed which sometimes present to us one appearance sometimes another and which do not always appear to the same people in the same way we term fictions of the senses but it is far otherwise for neither parent nor nurse nor master nor poet nor drama deceive our senses nor do popular prejudices seduce them from the truth but all kinds of snares are laid for the mind either by those errors which i have just enumerated which taking possession of the young and uneducated imbue them deeply and bend them any way they please or by that pleasure which is the imitator of goodness being thoroughly and closely implicated with all our senses the prolific mother of all evils for she so corrupts us by her blandishments that we no longer perceive some things which are essentially excellent because they have none of this deliciousness and pruriency it follows that i may now sum up the whole of this argument by asserting as is plain to every one from these positions which have been already laid down that all right and all that is honourable is to be sought for its own sake in truth all virtuous men love justice and equity for what they are in themselves nor is it like a good man to make a mistake and love that which does not deserve their affection right therefore is desirable and deserving to be cultivated for its own sake and if this be true of right it must be true also of justice what then shall we say of liberality is it exercised gratuitously or does it covet some reward and recompense if a man does good without expecting any recompense for his kindness then it is gratuitous if he does expect compensation it is a mere matter of traffic nor is there any doubt that he who truly deserves the reputation of a generous and kind-hearted man is thinking of his duty not of his interest in the same way the virtue of justice demands neither emolument nor salary and therefore we desire it for its own sake and the case of all the moral virtues is the same and so is the opinion formed of them besides this if we weigh virtue by the mere utility and profit that attend it and not by its own merit the one virtue which results from such an estimate will be in fact a species of vice for the more a man refers all his actions especially to his own advantage the further he recedes from probity so that they who measure virtue by profit acknowledge no other virtue than this 
which is a kind of vice for who can be called benevolent if no one ever acts kindly for the sake of another and where are we to find a grateful person if those who are disposed to be so can find no benefactor to whom they can show gratitude what will become of sacred friendship if we are not to love our friend for his own sake with all our heart and soul as people say if we are even to desert and discard him as soon as we despair of deriving any further assistance or advantage from him what can be imagined more inhuman than this conduct but if friendship ought rather to be cultivated on its own account so also for the same reason are society equality and justice desirable for their own sakes if this be not so then there can be no such thing as justice at all for the most unjust thing of all is to seek a reward for one's just conduct what then shall we say of temperance sobriety continence modesty bashfulness and chastity is it the fear of infamy or the dread of judgments and penalties which prevent men from being intemperate and dissolute do men then live in innocence and moderation only to be well spoken of and to acquire a certain fair reputation modest men blush even to speak of indelicacy and i am greatly ashamed of those philosophers who assert that there are no vices to be avoided but those which the laws have branded with infamy for what shall i say can we call those persons truly chaste who abstain from adultery merely for the fear of public exposure and that disgrace which is only one of its many evil consequences for what can be either praised or blamed with reason if you depart from that great law and rule of nature which makes the difference between right and wrong shall corporal defects if they are remarkable shock our sensibilities and shall those of the soul make no impression on us of the soul i say whose turpitude is so evidently proved by its vices for what is there more hideous than avarice more brutal than lust more contemptible than cowardice more base than stupidity and folly well then are we to call those persons unhappy who are conspicuous for one or more of these on account of some injuries or disgraces or sufferings to which they are exposed or on account of the moral baseness of their sins and we may apply the same test in the opposite way to those who are distinguished for their virtue lastly if virtue be sought for on account of some other things it necessarily follows that there is something better than virtue is it money then is it fame or beauty or health all of which appear of little value to us when we possess them nor can it be by any possibility certainly known how long they will last or is it what it is shameful even to utter that basest of all pleasure surely not for it is in the contempt and disdain of pleasure that virtue is most conspicuous do not you see what a long series of facts and arguments i have brought forward and how perfect is the connection between one and another i should have proceeded further still if i had not kept myself in check quintus to what point do your arguments tend my brother for i would willingly go hand in hand with you through this discussion marcus the point they bear on is the moral end of our actions to which all things are to be referred and for the sake of which all things are to be undertaken this subject is however one of great controversy and full of question among the learned yet one that must some day or other be decided atticus how can that be done since gellius is no longer alive quintus what is that to the purpose atticus because when i was at athens i recollect hearing from my friend phaedrus that your friend gellius when he came as proconsul into greece after his praetorship assembled all the philosophers who were at that time at athens in one spot 
and very earnestly pressed upon them his advice that they should endeavour to come to some unanimous agreement in their controversies urging that if they were so disposed as to be unwilling to spend their whole lives in discord an agreement might be made and at the same time he promised them his best assistance if this scheme of mutual conciliation and concession met their views marcus your story is amusing enough my atticus and it has often excited much merriment but indeed i should very gladly be appointed mediator between the ancient academy and the stoics atticus how can you think of such a thing marcus because they differ on one point only and agree to admiration in all the rest atticus what do they contend about one point of debate only marcus yes i think they have only a single issue so far as concerns this question of morals inasmuch as the ancient academicians are unanimously agreed that the true good is that which is in accordance with nature and is such that we may be assisted in life by it the stoics on the other hand allow of no good but what is honourable atticus this is indeed a very insignificant controversy and not such as to account for their general opposition marcus you are quite right if it were the thing itself on which they differed rather than the terms atticus you then rather agree with my friend antiochus with whom i was living for i will not venture to call him my master it was he who at one time almost persuaded me to desert my epicurean gardens and led me by gentle steps to the academy marcus this antiochus was a wise and clever man and highly accomplished in his way he was as you know a great friend of mine and i shall presently examine whether i agree with him in all respects or not this i am sure of that the whole of that controversy might easily be settled atticus why do you prosecute this inquiry marcus because if as ariston of chios pretended he were to say that there is no other good than the honourable and no other evil than the dishonourable that all other things are altogether indifferent and that their presence or absence are of no kind of consequence then zeno would be departing very far from xenocrates aristotle and all the school of plato and there would be an entire difference between them respecting a principle of the greatest importance and about the whole course of life but now when he affirms that to be the only good which the ancients asserted to be the chief good namely honour and its opposite disgrace which they called the chief evil the only evil and when he calls riches health and beauty only advantages not goods and poverty grief and pain only inconveniences not evils he in fact agrees in opinion with xenocrates and aristotle though he expresses himself in different terms from this difference not respecting things but words the controversy concerning moral ends arose in relation to which inasmuch as our roman law of the twelve tables has granted a neutral space of five feet wide between the territories of different landlords we will not allow the venerable estate of the academy to be trespassed on by this crafty stoic and though the mamelian law appointed but one surveyor to determine the rights of these neutral spaces in this ethical question all three of us will undertake to arbitrate respecting the moral ends of philosophy quintus what then shall be the decision which we pronounce marcus i think we should seek the boundaries which socrates has laid down in relation to this question and abide by them quintus there cannot be a better proposal my brother and now you are employing the terms of civil justice and laws on which topics i am waiting for a lecture from you for the subject is particularly important as i have often heard you say 
and certainly we have sufficiently established the principle we have been discussing and proved that to live according to nature is the highest good that is to lead a life regulated by conscience and conformed to virtue and temperance and to follow nature and to live according to her law that is to say as far as depends on the person himself to omit nothing to secure nature in the attainment of those things which she requires this surely is the most lawful and virtuous mode of living as to the discussions of philosophers i know not whether we shall ever arrive at a decision but we certainly shall not do so in our present conference at least if we prosecute our original design and come to the practical investigation of the civil law as established in our country atticus i however turned aside to this digression very willingly quintus we shall have an opportunity of renewing this subject on some future occasion let us at present keep to what we began with as especially since this discussion respecting the chief good and evil has no reference to our present subject marcus what you say my quintus is most wise and excellent for what has hitherto been said by me is derived from the very heart of philosophy but you perhaps wish to have the laws of some particular state discussed quintus i am not anxious to hear of the laws of lycurgus or of solon or of charondas or zalicos nor of our roman twelve tables nor of popular decrees but i expect you to describe in this day's conversation not only the laws fitted for all nations but also the rules and maxims of conduct that may apply to individuals marcus and indeed what you expect my quintus harmonizes very well with the subjects of our present discussion and i wish that it were within my abilities to do justice to it but the real state of the case is that since law ought to be both a correctress of vice and a recommender of virtue the principles on which we direct our conduct ought to be drawn from her and thus it comes to pass wisdom is the mother of all the virtuous arts from the love of which the greeks have composed the word philosophy and which is beyond all contradiction the richest the brightest and the most excellent of the gifts which the gods have bestowed on the life of mankind for wisdom alone has taught us among other things the most difficult of all lessons namely to know ourselves a precept so forcible and so comprehensive that it has been attributed not to a man but to the god of delphi himself for he who knows himself must in the first place be conscious that he is inspired by a divine principle and he will look upon his rational part as a resemblance to some divinity consecrated within him and will always be careful that his sentiments as well as his external behaviour be worthy of so inestimable a gift of god and after he has thoroughly examined himself and tested himself in every way he will become aware what signal advantages he has received from nature at his entrance into life and with what infinite means and appliances he is furnished for the attainment and acquisition of wisdom since in the very beginning of all things he has as it were the intelligible principles of things delineated as it were on his mind and soul by the enlightening assistance of which and the guidance of wisdom he sees that he shall become a good and consequently a happy man for what can be described or conceived more truly happy than the state of that man whose mind having attained to an exact knowledge and perception of virtue has entirely discarded all obedience to and indulgence of the body and has trampled on voluptuousness as a thing unbecoming the dignity of his nature and has raised himself above all fear of death or pain who maintains a benevolent intercourse with his friends 
and has learnt to look upon all who are united to him by nature as his kindred who has learnt to preserve piety and reverence towards the gods and pure religion and who has sharpened and improved the perceptions of his mind as well as of his eyesight to choose the good and reject the evil which virtue from its foreseeing things is called prudence when this man shall have surveyed the heavens the earth and the seas and studied the nature of all things and informed himself from whence they have been generated to what state they will return and of the time and manner of their dissolution and has learnt to distinguish what parts of them are mortal and perishable and what divine and eternal when he shall have almost attained to a knowledge of that being who superintends and governs these things and shall look on himself as not confined within the walls of one city or as the member of any particular community but as a citizen of the whole universe considered as a single commonwealth amid such a grand magnificence of things as this and such a prospect and knowledge of nature what a knowledge of himself o ye immortal gods will a man arrive at that is the warning of the pythian apollo and how insignificant will he then esteem how thoroughly will he contemn and despise those things which by vulgar minds are held in the highest admiration and all these acquirements he will secure and guard as by a sort of fence by the knowledge how to distinguish truth from falsehood and by a certain science and art of reasoning which teaches him to know what consequences follow from premises and what proposition is contrary to another and when such a person feels that nature has designed him for civil society he will not rest contented with these subtle disquisitions alone but will put in practice that more comprehensive and continuous eloquence by which he may be able to govern nations to establish laws to punish malefactors to defend the honest part of mankind and publish the praises of great men by which also he may fitly put forth precepts of safety and panegyrics of virtue in a way suited to persuade his countrymen by which also he may be able to rouse them to the practice of virtue and turn them from wickedness to comfort the afflicted and in fine to immortalize the wise consultations and noble actions of the brave and wise and to punish the shame and infamy of wicked men by handing them down in undying records and of all these important things which are perceived to be in man by those who wish to attain a knowledge of themselves the parent and nurse is wisdom atticus you have given us a very dignified and just eulogium on her but on what do you mean your remarks to bear marcus in the first place my atticus i mean them to bear on those jurisprudential topics which we shall hereafter discuss which are well nigh as important as the preceding for these moral principles we have already developed would not be so grand and so interesting if the sources from which they arise were not also full of sublimity and beauty and for the rest i prosecute this inquiry with pleasure and i trust with justice for i cannot with any conscience pass over in silence that study to which i am devoted and which has made me all that i am atticus you speak truly and as that study deserves and it was as you say proper to do so in this discussion end of book one Recording in memory of Part One of Book Two of On the Laws by Marcus Tullius Cicero, translated by Charles Duke Young. Introduction to the Second Book. In this second book, Cicero treats of hierarchical and ecclesiastical laws and 
lays down a number of ecclesiastical canons or maxims which he subsequently expounds at large atticus do you feel inclined since we have had walking enough for the present and since you must now take up a fresh part of the subject for discussion to vary our situation if you do let us pass over to the island which is surrounded by the fibrinus for such i believe is the name of the other river and sit down while we prosecute the remainder of our discourse marcus i like your proposal for that is the very spot which i generally select when i want a place for undisturbed meditation or uninterrupted reading or writing atticus in truth now i am come to this delicious retreat i cannot see too much of it would you believe that the pleasure i find here makes me almost despise magnificent villas marble pavements and sculptured palaces who would not smile at the artificial canals which our great folks call their niles and eurapi after he had seen these beautiful streams therefore as you just now in our conversation on justice and law referred all things to nature so you seek to preserve her domination even in those things which are constructed to recreate and amuse the mind i therefore used to wonder before as i expected nothing better in this neighbourhood than hills and rocks and indeed i had been led to form these ideas by your own speeches and verses i used to wonder i say that you were so exceedingly delighted with this place but my present wonder on the contrary is how when you retire from rome you condescend to rusticate in any other spot marcus but when i can escape for a few days especially at this season of the year i usually do come here on account of the beauty of the scenery and the salubrity of the air but it is but seldom that i have it in my power to do so there is one reason however why i am so fond of this arpinum which does not apply to you atticus what reason is that marcus because to confess the truth it is the native place of myself and my brother here for here indeed descended from a very ancient race we first saw the day here is our altar here are our ancestors and here still remain many vestiges of our family besides this villa which you behold in its present form was originally constructed at considerable expense under my father's superintendence for having very infirm health he spent the later years of his life here engaged in literary pursuits and on this very place too while my grandfather was alive and while the villa according to the olden custom was but a little one like that one of curius in the sabine district i myself was born there is therefore an indescribable feeling insensibly pervading my soul and sense which causes me perhaps to find a more than usual pleasure in this place and even the wisest of men ulysses is related to have renounced immortality that he might once more revisit his beloved ithaca atticus i indeed think what you have mentioned a very sufficient reason for your feelings and for your coming hither with pleasure and being attached to this place moreover i myself to say the truth feel that my love for this house and all this neighbourhood increases when i remember that you were born and bred up here for somehow or other we certainly cannot behold without emotion the spots in which we find traces of those who possess our esteem or admiration and for my own part even in the case of athens itself which i love so greatly it is not so much the magnificent works and exquisite specimens of art of the ancients which delight me as the remembrance of her great men and the thought where each of them used to live and sit down and discourse 
even their very tombs do i contemplate with deep attention and with the same feelings i shall for the future love the place the more where you were born marcus that being the case i am very glad that i have brought you here and shown you what i may almost call my cradle atticus and i am greatly pleased at having seen it but what were you going to say just now when you called this arpinum the true country of yourself and your brother quintus have you more than one country or any other than that roman commonwealth in which we have a similar interest unless indeed you mean to say that the true country of the philosophic cato was not rome but tusculum marcus i indeed should say that cato and all municipal citizens like him have two countries the one that of their birth and the other that of their citizenship as in the case of cato who having been born at tusculum was elected a citizen of rome so that as he was a tusculan by extraction and a roman by citizenship he had one country as his native place and another as his country in law so among your athenians before theseus urged them to quit their rural territories and assembled them at athens those that were natives of sunium were reckoned as sunians and athenians at the same time and in the same way we justly consider as our country both the place from where we originated and that in which we have been received it is necessary however that we should attach ourselves by a preference of affection to the latter which under the name of the commonwealth is the common country of us all for this country it is that we ought to sacrifice our lives it is to her that we ought to devote ourselves without reserve and it is for her that we ought to risk all our riches and consecrate all our hopes but still that land which produced us is not much less dear to us than that which has received us therefore i will never disown arpinum as my country at the same time acknowledging that rome is the greater of the two and that the other is contained in her atticus it was not then without reason that pompey said in my hearing when he pleaded conjointly with you the cause of ambius that our commonwealth owed great gratitude to this municipality for having given it two of its preservers for my part i quite agree with you that your native place may be called your country no less correctly than the commonwealth of rome but here we are arrived in your favourite island how beautiful it appears how bravely it stems the waves of the fibrinus whose divided waters lave its verdant sides and soon rejoin their rapid currents the river just embraces space enough for a moderate walk and having discharged this office and secured us an arena for disputation it immediately precipitates itself into the liris and then like those who ally themselves to patrician families it loses its more obscure name and gives the waters of the liris a greater degree of coolness for i have never found water much colder than this although i have seen a great number of rivers and i can hardly bear my foot in it when i wish to do what socrates did in plato's phaedrus marcus you are quite right but my brother quintus often tells me that your river theamis in epirus is nothing inferior to even this delightful spot in beauty quintus and that is the truth too and i would have you believe that nothing on earth can surpass the beauties of our friend atticus's amalthium and its plain trees but if you have no objection let us repose here in the shade and return to that part of our subject from which we have digressed marcus you are very persevering in your demands my quintus 
i thought that we had done with the question but you are not a man to allow any one to remain in your debt quintus pray begin then for all this day is devoted to hearing you marcus quote, with jupiter the muses shall begin close quote as i said in my translation of atatos atticus wherefore this exordium marcus because on this occasion we cannot do better than commence by invoking him and the other immortal gods quintus there can be no objection to this it is but decent and proper marcus let us then once more examine before we come to the consideration of particular laws what is the power and nature of law in general lest when we come to refer everything to it we occasionally make mistakes from the employment of incorrect language and show ourselves ignorant of the force of those terms which we ought to employ in the definition of laws quintus this is a very necessary caution and the proper method of seeking truth marcus this then as it appears to me has been the decision of the wisest philosophers that law was neither a thing contrived by the genius of man nor established by any decree of the people but a certain eternal principle which governs the entire universe wisely commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong therefore they called that aboriginal and supreme law the mind of god enjoining or forbidding each separate thing in accordance with reason on which account it is that this law which the gods have bestowed on the human race is so justly applauded for it is the reason and mind of a wise being equally able to urge us to good and to deter us from evil quintus you have on more than one occasion already touched on this topic but before you come to treat of the laws of nations i wish you would endeavour to explain the force and power of this divine and celestial law lest the torrent of custom should overwhelm our understanding and betray us into the vulgar method of expression marcus from our childhood we have learned my quintus to call such phrases as this quote, that a man appeals to justice and goes to law close quote, and many similar expressions law but nevertheless we should understand that these and other similar commandments and prohibitions have sufficient power to lead us on to virtuous actions and to call us away from vicious ones which power is not only far more ancient than any existence of states and peoples but is coeval with god himself who beholds and governs both heaven and earth for it is impossible that the divine mind can exist in a state devoid of reason and divine reason must necessarily be possessed of a power to determine what is virtuous and what is vicious nor because it was nowhere written that one man should maintain the pass of a bridge against the enemy's whole army and that he should order the bridge behind him to be cut down are we therefore to imagine that the valiant cocles did not perform this great exploit agreeably to the laws of nature and the dictates of true bravery again though in the reign of tarquin there was no written law concerning adultery it does not therefore follow that sextus tarquinius did not offend against the eternal law when he committed a rape on lucretia daughter of tricipitinus for even then he had the light of reason deduced from the nature of things that incites to good actions and dissuades from evil ones and which does not begin for the first time to be a law when it is drawn up in writing but from the first moment that it exists and this existence of moral obligation is coeternal with that of the divine mind therefore the true and supreme law whose commands and prohibitions are equally authoritative is the right reason of the sovereign jupiter quintus 
i grant you my brother that whatever is just is also at all times the true law nor can this true law either be originated or abrogated by the written forms in which decrees are drawn up marcus therefore as that divine mind or reason is the supreme law so it exists in the mind of the sage so far as it can be perfected in man but with respect to civil laws which are drawn up in various forms and framed to meet the occasional requirements of the people the name of law belongs to them not so much by right as by the favour of the people for men prove by some such arguments as the following that every law which deserves the name of a law ought to be morally good and laudable it is clear say they that laws were originally made for the security of the people for the preservation of states for the peace and happiness of society and that they who first framed enactments of that kind persuaded the people that they would write and publish such laws only as should conduce to the general morality and happiness if they would receive and obey them and then such regulations being thus settled and sanctioned they justly entitled laws from which we may reasonably conclude that those who made unjustifiable and pernicious enactments for the people acted in a manner contrary to their own promises and professions and established anything rather than laws properly so called since it is evident that the very signification of the word law comprehends the whole essence and energy of justice and equity i would therefore interrogate you on this point my quintus as those philosophers are in the habit of doing if a state wants something for the want of which it is reckoned no state at all must not that something be something good quintus a very great good marcus and if a state has no law is it not for that reason to be reckoned no state at all quintus we must need say so marcus we must therefore reckon law among the very best things quintus i entirely agree with you marcus if then in the majority of nations many pernicious and mischievous enactments are made which have no more right to the name of law than the mutual engagements of robbers are we bound to call them laws for as we cannot call the recipes of ignorant and unskilful empirics who give poisons instead of medicines the prescriptions of a physician so likewise we cannot call that the true law of a people of whatever kind it may be if it enjoins what is injurious let the people receive it as they will for law is the just distinction between right and wrong made conformable to that most ancient nature of all the original and principal regulator of all things by which the laws of men should be measured whether they punish the guilty or protect and preserve the innocent quintus i quite understand you and think that no law but that of justice should either be proclaimed as one or enforced as one marcus then you regard as null and void the laws of titius and apuleius because they are unjust quintus yes and i would say the same of the laws of Livius. marcus you are right and so much the more since a single vote of the senate would be sufficient to abrogate them in an instant but that law of justice the power of which i have explained can never be discarded or abrogated quintus and therefore you will require such laws as can never be abrogated marcus certainly if i could get you both to agree with me but plato that wisest of all men that most dignified of all philosophers who was the first man who ever composed a treatise on a commonwealth and afterwards a separate one on laws induces me to follow his illustrious example and to proclaim the praises of law before i begin to recite its regulations such likewise was the practice of zalicos and charondas who wrote the laws which they gave their cities not for the sake of study or amusement but for the benefit of their country and their fellow-citizens 
and imitating them plato considered that it was the property of law to persuade in some instances and not to compel everything by threats and violence quintus what do you venture to cite zalicos when timaeus denied that he ever existed marcus but theophrastus an author in my opinion quite as respectable and as many think much more so corroborates my statement his fellow-citizens too my clients the locrians commemorate him but whether he was a real man or not is of no great consequence to our argument we are only speaking according to tradition let this therefore be a fundamental principle in all societies that the gods are the supreme lords and governors of all things that all events are directed by their influence and wisdom and divine power that they deserve very well of the race of mankind and that they likewise know what sort of person every one really is that they observe his actions whether good or bad that they take notice with what feelings and with what piety he attends to his religious duties and that they are sure to make a difference between the good and the wicked for when once our minds are confirmed in these views it will not be difficult to inspire them with true and useful sentiments for what can be more true than that no man should be so madly presumptuous as to believe that he has either reason or intelligence while he does not believe that the heaven and the world possess them likewise or to think that those things which he can scarcely comprehend by the greatest possible exertion of his intellect are put in motion without the agency of reason in truth we can scarcely reckon him a man whom neither the regular courses of the stars nor the alternations of day and night nor the temperature of the seasons nor the productions that nature displays for his use and enjoyment urge to gratitude towards heaven and as those beings which are furnished with reason are incomparably superior to those which want it and as we cannot say without impiety that anything is superior to the universal nature we must therefore confess that divine reason is contained within her and who will dispute the utility of these sentiments when he reflects how many cases of the greatest importance are decided by oaths how much the sacred rites performed in making treaties tend to assure peace and tranquillity and what numbers of people the fear of divine punishment has reclaimed from a vicious course of life and how sacred the social rights must be in a society where a firm persuasion obtains the immediate intervention of the immortal gods both as witnesses and judges of our actions such is the quote, preamble of the law close quote, to use the expression of plato quintus i understand you my brother and i am greatly pleased to find that you take a different view of the subject and dwell upon other points of it than those which he selects for nothing can less resemble his opinions than what you have just now asserted even in this preamble the only matter in which you seem to me to imitate him is his style and language marcus i wish indeed i did but who is or whoever will be able to imitate that as to his sentiments it is easy enough to translate them and indeed that is what i should do if i did not wish to be altogether original for what difficulty is there in stating the same doctrines as he does translated from him almost word for word quintus i entirely agree with you for as you have just remarked your arguments ought to be entirely your own begin then if you will do us the favour and expound the laws of religion marcus i will explain them as well as i can and since both the topic and the conversation is a familiar one i shall begin by describing the laws of laws quintus what laws do you mean marcus there are certain terms in law my quintus not so ancient as those in the primitive sacred laws but still in order to carry with them greater authority 
being of a somewhat greater antiquity than the common parlance of the people these legal terms i shall mention with as much brevity as possible and i shall endeavour to expound the laws not indeed in their whole extent for this would be a boundless subject but those which involve the principles and contain the sum and substance of the rest quintus this appears a most desirable method let us therefore hear the terms of the law marcus such are the following let men approach the gods with purity let men appear before them in the spirit of devotion let men remove riches from their temples whoever doth otherwise shall suffer the vengeance of heaven let no one have private gods neither new gods nor strange gods unless publicly acknowledged are to be worshipped privately let the temples which our fathers have constructed in the cities be upheld let the people maintain the groves in the country and the abodes of the lares let men preserve the customs of their fathers and of their family let the gods who have always been accounted celestial be worshipped and those likewise who have merited celestial honours by their illustrious actions such as hercules bacchus esculapius castor pollux and quirinus let due honour be likewise paid to those virtues by which man is exalted to heaven as intelligence valour piety fidelity and let temples be consecrated to their honour with regard to the vices let no sacred sacrifices be paid to them let men put aside all contentions of every kind on the sacred festivals and let servants enjoy them their toils being remitted for therefore they were appointed at certain seasons let the priests duly render the public thank-offerings to heaven with herbs and fruits on the sacrificial days also on the appointed holidays let them offer up the cream of milk and the sucklings and lest the priests should commit any mistakes in these sacrifices or the reason of these sacrifices let them carefully observe the calendar and the revolutions of the stars let them provide those particular victims which are most appropriate and agreeable to each particular deity let the different gods have different orders of priests sacerdotes let them all have pontiffs in common and let each separate god have his flamen let the vestal virgins in the city carefully keep the eternal fire of the public altar always burning and that this may be done both publicly and privately with all due form and ceremony let those who are not instructed in the order of the ceremonials learn it from the public priests let there be two classes of these priests one to preside over ceremonials and sacrifices and the other to interpret the obscure predictions of the prophets and diviners whenever the senate and the people require it let the public augurs who are the interpreters of the all-good and all-great jupiter likewise examine the presages and the auspices according to the discipline of their art let the priests who are conversant in auguries implore prosperity for the vineyards and gardens and pray for the general welfare of the people let those who give counsel in military or civic affairs attend to the auspices and be guided by them let them guard against the anger of heaven and appease it and observe from what parts of heaven the lightnings burst forth let them declare what lands cities and temples are to be held free and consecrated whatever things the augur declares to be unjust ill-omened vicious and accursed let them be forsaken as prohibited and disastrous and whoever will not obey these divine indications let him suffer capital punishment as to alliances peace war truces and the rights of ambassadors let the two fecialis be the appropriate judges and 
let them determine all questions relating to military affairs let them report all prodigies and portents to the etruscans and soothsayers if the senate orders it and let the chiefs of etruria explain their system then will they learn what deities it behoves them to propitiate and deprecate the fury of the thunderbolt against the object of its vengeance let there be no nocturnal sacrifices performed by women except those which they offer according to custom on behalf of the people and let none be initiated in the mysteries except by the usual forms consecrated to ceres according to the grecian ceremonials a crime which has been committed and cannot be expiated has been an act of impiety as to the faults which can be expiated let the public priests expiate them let men temper the public hilarity with song and harp and flute at the public games as far as can be done without the games of the race-course and the wrestling matches and let them unite these amusements with the honours of the gods let them retain whatever is best and purest in the ancient form of worship except the devotees of sibylle to whom this privilege is allowed on certain days let no one presume to levy rates for private emolument whoever purloins or robs any temple or steals any property deposited in a temple shall be accounted a parricide the divine punishment of perjury is destruction the human penalty is infamy with regard to incest let the chief priests sentence it to the extremest penalty of the law let not the impious man attempt to appease the gods by gifts and offerings let vows be carefully performed wherever law is violated let its punishments be executed let no private person presume to consecrate his land and let his consecration of gold silver and ivory be made within the limits of moderation let the sacred actions of private persons be preserved inviolate for ever let the rites of the deities of the dead be considered sacred let those who have passed into the world of souls be considered as deified but let men diminish the unnecessary expense and sorrow which is lavished on them atticus you have managed to include a great deal of law in a very small compass but it seems to me that this class of religious maxims does not much differ from the laws of numa and our national regulations marcus do you suppose then that when in my treatise on the commonwealth scipio appears to be arguing that our ancient roman commonwealth was the best of all republics it was not indispensable that i should give laws of corresponding excellence to that best of all republics atticus undoubtedly i think you should marcus well then you may expect such laws as may embrace that most perfect kind of republic and if any others should haply be demanded of me this day which are not to be found and never have existed in our roman commonwealth yet even these formed a portion of the customs of our ancestors which at that time were maintained as religiously as the laws themselves atticus proceed then if you please to propose these laws that i may have the pleasure of ratifying them by my vote marcus are you sure my atticus that when you hear them you will not say something very different atticus i do not think so i believe i shall entirely agree with you respecting the greater laws and as for the minor ones i shall concede them to you and pass sentence accordingly marcus and that is my opinion too however take care that it does not turn out a long business atticus i wish it might for what could we find to do which could be more delightful marcus one of the legal maxims i have mentioned states that we should approach the gods with purity that is to say with purity of mind 
for this is everything not that the law dispenses with purity of body but this must be understood inasmuch as the mind is far superior to the body and it may be observed that if we are to be attentive to the purity of our persons we ought to be still more so to the purity of our souls for the pollutions of the body may indeed be removed by a few ablutions of water or in a few days but the stains of the conscience cannot be obliterated by any lapse of time and all the rivers in the world cannot wash them out the next legal maxim commands us to cultivate piety and to banish costliness from our temples which signifies that piety is grateful to god and that all extravagance is displeasing to him for if in our social relations we desire that distinctions of wealth and poverty should not induce us to forget the fraternal equality of men why should we throw a stumbling-block in the approaches of mortals to their maker by requiring costly sacrifices and offerings especially since nothing could be less agreeable to the deity than to see that the way to propitiate and worship him was not open to all men and with respect to the statement that god is not merely a judge but an avenger the sense of religion appears to be strengthened by the fear of immediate punishment which awaits the offender and for individuals to worship private gods or new gods or strange gods would introduce a confusion of religions and all kinds of unknown ceremonies this is not the way in which gods accepted by the priests and by the senate should be worshipped even if they approved of such regulations i think the temples of our ancestors should be maintained in our cities in which respect i do not agree with the doctrine of the persian magi by whose advice they say xerxes set fire to the temples of the greeks because they enclosed between the walls the gods to whom all things are free and open and whose appropriate temple and dwelling-place is the boundless universe the greeks and the romans after them have adopted a more rational opinion who in order to confirm the devotion which we entertain for the gods have wished them to inhabit the same cities which we abide in ourselves for this opinion promotes a religion which has a useful influence on society for according to the noble sentence of pythagoras then chiefly do piety and religion flourish in our souls when we are occupied in divine services and according to thales the most renowned of the seven sages of greece men ought to be persuaded that all things which are seen are full of the gods for that all men will be the more pure and holy when they frequent the temples of the gods for there in a certain sense they have the divine images not only impressed on their minds but actually presented before their eyes the same argument applies to the preservation of the sylvan fanes and sacred groves nor are the religious honours which according to ancestral custom masters and servants pay to the lares in the courts of our villas and farms to be abated the rights of ancestors are likewise to be preserved in their families for since the ancients approached nearest to the gods that religion which the gods handed down to them is a tradition most worthy of memorial and when the law commands us to render divine honours to those of the human race who have been consecrated as deities such as hercules and the rest of the demigods it indicates that the souls of all men indeed are immortal but that those of saints and heroes are divine it is right also that intelligence piety valour and fidelity should be formally consecrated all of whom possess temples which have been publicly dedicated to them at rome so that those who cultivate these admirable virtues as indeed all worthy men do may think that they have the gods themselves seated in their souls but what is scarcely to be tolerated is that at athens 
they should have raised a temple to insolence and impudence as they did at the instigation of epimenides of crete after the expiation of the crime of chelon for it is the virtues and not the vices which it is becoming to consecrate now there is an ancient altar on the palatine hill dedicated to fever and another on the esquiline hill sacred to misfortune which is detestable for all things of this kind should be repudiated but when we forge titles according to the fancy of the poets and call jove vicepota from his power of conquering and taking possession and speak too of stata and stator and the invincible jupiter and consecrate the names of desirable things such as safety honour wealth and victory we perhaps do little harm and since our minds are supported by the expectation of excellent things it was not amiss for calatinus to consecrate hope and fortune may be either this day's fortune for she embraces all days or retrospective fortune as bringing assistance and we may worship her as chance as presiding over irregular accidents or under the name of prima genia from producing then comes the order of festivals and holidays in which all men should be free and spend their time without strife or litigation and which afford the slaves periods of rest and cessation from labour which the arranger of the calendar ought to appoint with a just reference to the seasons of the year so that their distribution may rather facilitate than interrupt the useful labours of agriculture and with respect to the time when the rites of sacrifice are to be offered with the young animals appointed by law the exact intervals of intercalation are to be accurately observed an institution which originating with numa was impaired by the negligence of subsequent pontiffs it is not desirable to change the regulations which the pontiffs and soothsayers have made respecting what sacrifices are to be offered to each god as to whether they are to be full-grown victims or sucklings or males or females with respect to the priests the great number of those who serve all the gods and those too who are attached to a single deity ought to be ready to answer all questions about law and to explain all the ordinances and duties of religion now as vesta according to the meaning of the greek word which the latins have retained is as it were the perpetual fire of the city the vestal virgins preside over it with the greatest propriety that they may the more easily keep the sacred flame ever burning and inviolable and that women may learn that the purest chastity constitutes the perfection of their nature what follows concerns not religion only but the general order of the state namely the prohibition which restrains private individuals from offering sacrifices without the superintendence of the public ministers of religion for it amounts to this that under a sound government the people have always need of the counsel and authority of the chief men and the order of priests should take cognizance of every kind of orthodox religion for there is one class appointed to propitiate the gods when offended who preside over solemn sacrifices others are ordained to interpret the predictions of the prophets not indeed of many prophets lest their tasks should be infinite and lest any one out of the college should know those matters which were decided on for the public good one of the greatest and most important offices in the commonwealth is that of the augurs conjoined as it is with the highest authority i do not say this because i am an augur myself but because we are bound to be of this opinion for what can be more important in respect of official dignity than the power of dismissing the assemblies of the people and the councils though convoked by the chief rulers or of annulling their enactments what i say can be more absolute power than that 
by which even a single augur can adjourn any political proceeding to another day what can be more transcendent than that authority which may command even consuls to lay down their office what more sacred than their power of granting or refusing permission to form treaties and compacts or their power of abrogating laws which have not been legitimately enacted as in the case of the titian law which was annulled by a decree of the pontifical college and the Lewian law which was likewise annulled by the advice of philippus who was at once consul and augur what can be more honourable than the fact that there is no edict of the magistrates relating either to domestic or foreign affairs which can be ratified without the augur's authority atticus i know all that and i confess that their authority is very great but there is a warm dispute in your colleges between marcellus and appius two of your best augurs for i have met with the books of both and i find that one of them affirms that auspices are merely got up for the interests of the state and the other seems to think that they really are supernatural divinations now i ask what is your opinion on this point marcus for myself i sincerely believe that there exists an art which the greeks call mantiki or divination and that the flight of birds and other signs which the augurs profess to observe form a part of this divination for when we grant the existence of the supreme gods and their intellectual government of the universe and their benignant consideration for the interests of the human race and their power of granting us intimations of future events i know not why we should deny the art of divination and the signs which they give are such as i have already mentioned by which the truth of my position is conclusively proved besides this not only does the history of our commonwealth afford us an infinite number of examples which confirm this truth but all kingdoms peoples and nations bear testimony that in many instances the predictions of augurs have been wonderfully fulfilled thus the traditions of polyidus melampus mopsos amphiaraeus calchus and helenus would not have made so much noise in the world nor would they at this time be accredited by so many nations arabians phrygians lycaonians cilicians and pisidians unless antiquity had handed them down as true and indisputable nor would our romulus have consulted the auspices before he founded rome nor would the name of accius navius have so long flourished in the memory of our citizens if events had not justified their wonderful predictions but doubtless this science and art of augury has to some extent vanished away by age and negligence therefore for my part i neither agree with marcellus who maintains that our college of augurs never was in possession of this science nor do i agree with claudius who asserts that we still preserve it and indeed it appears to me among our ancestors to have been of a twofold nature so that it was sometimes used for political convenience though very often as a real guide and director in counsel and action atticus i think that that was the case and i very much agree with these views of yours on the subject but proceed marcus i will and as concisely as possible what follows relates to the rights of war in commencing conducting and concluding which justice and good faith are of the greatest importance by our law we have therefore appointed public interpreters of these rights as to the religious duties of the soothsayers and their expiations and sacrifices i think that enough and more than enough is said in the law itself atticus i think so too since that branch of the law relates exclusively to religious ceremonials marcus 
as to what follows my atticus i scarcely know in what terms it becomes me to animadvert upon it or you to assent to it atticus what is that marcus the law respecting the nocturnal sacrifices of women atticus oh i assent to their suppression by all means with the exception of those solemn and public sacrifices contained in the law itself marcus but if we suppress the nocturnal sacrifices what will become of the august mysteries of iacos and the eumolpidae for we are constructing laws not for the romans only but for all just and valiant nations atticus i think it but courteous to accept those mysteries likewise in which we ourselves have been initiated marcus with all my heart let us accept them for it seems to me that among the many admirable and divine things your athenians have established to the advantage of human society there is nothing better than the mysteries by which we are polished and softened into politeness from the rude austerities of barbarism justly indeed are they called initiations for by them we especially learn the grand principles of life and gain not only the art of living agreeably but even that too of dying with a better hope but the comic poets are sufficient to show what displeases me in the nocturnal mysteries if such license was allowed at rome what abominations might not be committed by the man who should carry premeditated debauchery into the mysteries in which even a stolen glance was in ancient times a crime atticus content yourself with proposing this law for rome do not rob the greeks of their customs marcus well then let us return to our laws in which it is most diligently ordained that the clear daylight should be the safeguard of female virtue in the eyes of the multitude and that they should only be initiated in the mysteries of ceres according to the roman custom in reference to this topic we have an extraordinary instance of the severity of our ancestors in the public prosecution and punishment of the bacchanals by the senate supported by the consular armies and this severity of the roman government is not singular since diagondus of thebes in the middle of greece suppressed all nocturnal mysteries by a perpetual prohibition and aristophanes the most facetious of the old greek comedians so satirized the new gods and the nocturnal rites of their worship that he represents sabazios and other foreign deities condemned as aliens and obliged to pack off from the city but the public priest shall acquit of guilt those irregularities committed by imprudence and which have been carefully expiated but he shall judge as scandalous and impious the audacity which would introduce impure religious customs with respect to public shows and amusements since they are generally divided into those of the circus and of the theatre let corporeal contests such as running boxing wrestling and chariot races for the palm of victory be confined to the circus and let dramatic recitations with vocal music and singing and lyres and flutes be practised in the theatre as by law prescribed as long as they are kept within the bounds of moderation for i think with plato that nothing more readily influences tender and susceptible minds than the varied melodies of music whose power of raising both good and evil passions is almost beyond expression for music can excite the depressed and depress the excited and augment our energies or contract them it would have been well for many of the greek cities if they had maintained the spirited and invigorating character of their ancient music for since their music has been changed their morals and manners have lapsed into voluptuousness and effeminacy either because as some people think their dispositions have been depraved by the seducing and enervating music or because after severity of virtue had yielded to the temptation of other vices there was then found room both in their ears and inclinations 
for this change also therefore it was that plato that wisest and by far the most learned philosopher of greece so much dreaded the effects of music on his fellow-countrymen for he denied that it was possible to change the laws of music without likewise changing the public laws but though i am not quite so apprehensive as he with respect to the influence of music i by no means believe that it deserves to be slighted without going further let me observe the effect of that influence among our romans the verses of livius and Nivius, which used to be sung with a manly simplicity and energy are now chanted forth with all sorts of grimaces and contortions of the eyes and head according to the variation of the airs ancient greece never permitted this sort of conduct wisely foreseeing how gradually this kind of effeminacy if it once got possession of the citizens would ruin all their cities with false arts and evil principles and therefore the stern lacedaemon ordained that the harp of timotheus should possess but seven chords and that the rest should be taken away end of part one of book two recording in memory of part two of book two of on the laws by marcus tullius cicero translated by charles duke young part two of book two marcus our next legal maxim is that we should retain whatever is best in our ancient customs when the athenians consulted the pythian apollo what religious observances they should chiefly cultivate the oracle answered quote, those which were in accordance with the customs of their ancestors Close quote. and when the athenians came to consult the oracle again alleging that the customs of their ancestors had been often changed and desired to know which custom they should select from the variety the oracle replied the best and indeed the truth is that for the most part that is to be accounted the most ancient and the nearest the gods which is the best we have by another legal maxim prohibited the levy of rates for private emoluments with the exception of those that are made during a few days in honour of sibylle such a custom fills men's minds with superstition and impoverishes their families we have awarded a due punishment for all sacrilegious persons not those only who rob a temple but also those who steal anything which has been entrusted to a temple a custom which exists in many temples thus alexander is said to have consigned a sum of money in the temple of soli in cilicia and cleisthenes the athenian a very worthy citizen when he thought his fortune was in danger consigned his daughter's dowries to the care of juno in her temple at samos we must now come to the question of perjury with regard to the laws against incest this is not the place to say anything let impious criminals listen to plato that they may not dare to attempt to propitiate the gods with gifts for he forbids us to doubt what feelings god must entertain towards such when even a good man is not willing to receive presents from a wicked one diligence in paying our vows and care in making them as obligations to god is sufficiently enjoined in the law but the punishment of those who violate the sacred rights of religion cannot reasonably be objected to why need i here cite the examples of those impious wretches of whose crimes and punishments the tragedies are full let us rather speak of those things which come under our own observation and though i am apprehensive lest the following may seem to have surpassed the usual fortune of men yet as our present conversation is so familiar and confidential between ourselves i will hide nothing and i trust that what i shall say may be looked upon rather as a mark of my gratitude towards the immortal gods 
than as a piece of offensive boasting at that time all the laws of religion were polluted by the wickedness of abandoned citizens during the period of my banishment my domestic gods and lares were violated and a temple to licentiousness built on the ruins of their edifice while he who alone could defend them was driven from their altars consider then a moment for i need not mention names what was the termination of such proceedings i who suffered not the statue of minerva the guardian of our city to be polluted by impious hands during the universal ruin of my house and property and who conveyed her safely from my home to the temple of her own father did i not by thus acting obtain the suffrage of the senate and italy and in short of all nations of the earth as the preserver of my country than which what more glorious thing could happen to mortal man and of my enemies on the other hand who had abominably violated the sacred rights of religion some were put to confusion and banished into different countries but those who were their chiefs and who headed them in all their crimes and impieties not only suffered degradation during life but were denied the privilege of sepulture and funeral ceremonies quintus yes my brother you have described these events as they occurred and we cannot feel too grateful to the gods but we too often see conduct of this kind meet with a very different requital marcus that is because we judge not as we ought to judge respecting divine punishments but we are carried by the tide of public opinion into error and do not discern the true nature of things we estimate the miseries of man by death pain of body sorrow of mind or judicial punishments which i grant are accidents to which mankind is liable and are such as have befallen many good men and there is a grievous punishment of guilt which is in itself an evil of infinite magnitude even exclusive of the external results which attend it i have seen those who had they not been enemies to their country would never have been foes to me tormented beyond description by their own bad passions racked with concupiscence and with terror and evil conscience at one time through fear not knowing what to do at another contemning religion breaking down all the enactments of justice and corrupting the judgments of men though they could not corrupt the gods but i must restrain myself and go no further in invective and i have the less occasion to do so because my vengeance has already been carried beyond my desire i would only lay it down that thus much is proved that the divine punishment is of a twofold nature inasmuch as it consists in the pangs of conscience while they live and in such a character of them after they are dead that their destruction is approved of by the judgment and satisfaction of the living i entirely agree with plato that private estates ought not to be consecrated who if i can but translate them correctly uses nearly these words quote, the earth therefore is consecrated to all the gods as the grand altar of all homes therefore let no one consecrate a second time what is already consecrated as to gold and silver in cities or in private houses or in temples this sort of property is but a hateful thing to be consecrated as to ivory which is extracted from a lifeless body it is scarcely pure enough to be a gift for the gods brass and iron are the instruments of war not of a temple with regard to wood if any one wishes to dedicate a statue of wood to a divinity let it be formed from a single tree the same remark applies to the statues of stone in common temples as to the airy woven work it should not be more elaborate than a woman can make it in a month and the colour white is most agreeable to god in general 
and especially so in woven fabrics and let there be no dyed colours excepting on military decorations and the most suitable offerings which we can offer to the gods are birds and other simple figures such as one painter may draw in one day and let the other gifts have the same character of simplicity Close quote. such is the opinion of plato for my part i am not quite so strict in my limitations having to regard both the present tone of public morals and the luxurious habits of the times besides i suspect that agricultural industry would languish if superstitious ceremonials were allowed unduly to interfere with the cultivation of the ground by the instruments of husbandry atticus i understand you it remains for you to speak on the perpetual sacrifices and the rites of the manes marcus what a wonderful memory you possess my atticus i had forgotten that point atticus very likely nevertheless i recollect these things the better and expect them with more anxiety because they are associated both with the pontifical and civil law marcus very true and on these points our statutes and written enactments are very clear and distinct and for my part throughout all this familiar conversation to whatever kind of law our discussion may conduct me i will treat of our civil jurisprudence with as much simplicity as possible in such a manner that you may easily distinguish on what principle every legal case depends so that it will not be difficult for any one possessed of a moderate share of intelligence to find the rights of the question whatever new cause or consultation shall arise when he shall know how to refer the points of debate to their appropriate maxim but unhappily our lawyers either for the sake of raising casuistical objections in order that they may seem to know more difficult points than they really understand or as is most likely through ignorance of the art of teaching and conveying instruction for not only is art shown in knowing a thing but there is also a certain art in teaching it our lawyers i say often divide a legal doctrine which is essentially simple into an infinite variety of technical distinctions with relation to our present topic for instance what a wonderful cloud of sophistries has been raised by the two sivalas both pontiffs and both equally skilful in the law Quotes, often says publius the son quote, have i heard from my father that no one can make a good pontiff unless he understands the civil law Close quote. what the whole of it why so what in the world has a pontiff to do with the rights of partition walls aqueducts etc or does he mean only that part of the civil law which is connected with ecclesiastical polity but how inconsiderable is this with the exception of certain sacrifices vows holidays burials and things of that kind why then should we make these of so much importance when the others are so insignificant concerning those sacrifices however which topic is a more extensive one this should be our only opinion that they should be preserved perpetually and pass in succession through families so that as i have stated in my account of the law the sacred rites may be constant on this principle the pontiffs have decided that these rites should be handed down through all generations so that their memorial should not fail with the life of the ancestor and that their obligations should devolve on those who inherit the family estates on this principle alone which might suffice for the regulation of all relative cases have our lawyers raised innumerable quibbles which fill their books they demand forsooth who are bound to administer these sacred rites common justice evidently points out the heir of the deceased 
for there is no other person who more appropriately occupies the position of him who has departed next to the heir stands the legatee who by the death of the deceased or by virtue of his will sometimes takes as much as all the heirs all this is implied in the maxim and perfectly corresponds to its design thirdly if there be no heir the obligation attaches to him who takes the largest share of the goods which belong to the deceased fourthly if there be no heir or legatee who receives anything it binds the chief creditor who gains the largest share of the estate the last person on whom the obligation of discharging the sacred rites can fall is the debtor of the defunct who not having discharged the debts he owed him will stand in the same position as if he had received a legacy to an equivalent amount it is thus that sivala instructed us in many points of law which were not so defined by our forefathers for they regulated the whole business in the following simple terms Quote, a person may become liable to the obligation of discharging the sacred rights of the deceased in three ways first as the heir secondly as the legatee who takes the greater part of the property thirdly as the largest creditor in case the estate is encumbered but we learn one thing from sivala the pontiff namely that all the new arrangements depend on a single principle which is the wish of the priests to attach the money to the sacred rites and they judge all festivals and ceremonies by the same rule the sivalas likewise establish this regulation when there is a division of the inheritance namely that if a due allowance is not set down in the legacy and the legatees receive less than all the heirs they should not be bound to discharge the sacred rites in donations however they interpret the same thing in quite a different manner and ratify whatever the ancestor shall approve in the donation of a person under his superintendence and do not ratify whatever has been done without his approbation and participation on such topics a thousand little questions arise which any one who does not at once understand them may solve by himself by referring them to their proper maxim and principle for instance if through fear of being charged with the sacred rites a legatee took less than his legacy and afterwards one of the heirs of this legatee claimed on his own account that portion which the legatee had relinquished and these two sums joined together equal that which was bequeathed to all the heirs then he who claimed this relinquished portion would be bound to perform the sacred rites without encumbering his co-heirs they determine however with regard to the legatee that where the legacy is too great to be lawfully exempted from these rites he may pay a part by weight and balance to the testamentary heir so that in this case the heir being charged the money of the legatee is no further liable on this point as on many others i should be glad if you two sivalas supreme pontiffs and shrewd and able men as i confess you to be would inform me why you seek to perplex the pontifical law with the subtleties of the civil law for you in fact supersede the simple maxims of ecclesiastical jurisprudence by the endless technicalities of the civil legislation if the sacred rites are thus conjoined with pecuniary interests they are so by your authority as pontiffs rather than by any law of national obligation so long indeed as you remain pontiffs your pontifical jurisdiction will continue but as you happen to be exceedingly knowing in the civil law you may be able to elude the plainest maxims of the ecclesiastical for instance publius civila coruncanius 
and other chief pontiffs have determined that those legatees who take as much as all the heirs should be bound to discharge the sacred rites. Such is the pontifical law. Now, what has been added to it by the civil law? A rule of distributions composed with the utmost caution in favor of the legatee, for by the deduction of a hundred sesterces they have discovered a method of delivering the legatee from this troublesome duty. If, however, the testator omitted to make this proviso for the legatee, then this very mucius, the pontiff, who is also a lawyer, has contrived a new expedient in his favor. He has but to take less than all the heirs, and he gets a release. Our forefathers had stated with admirable good sense that those to whom the property came should discharge the sacred rites, but these pontiffs have rid them of all such obligations. As to the other quibble, it had no place in the pontifical law, and existed only in the civil code, I mean the sale by weight and balance, in order to discharge the testamentary heirs, and place the business in the same condition as if the legacy had not been granted, the legatee stipulating with respect to his legacy that he should pay over a certain sum by stipulation, and so. Footnote. There is a hiatus here. The translation in the text is that of the conjectural restoration of Lambinos. End footnote. Bracket. I now come to the rites of the manes, or ghosts of the dead, which our ancestors most widely instituted, and most religiously observed. They therefore ordained that the people should sacrifice for the ghosts of the dead in the month of February, then the last month in the year by the ecclesiastical calendar. Decius Brutus, however, according to the writings of Cicena, usually discharged these ceremonials in December. When I consult my own knowledge for the reason of this proceeding, I think I discover the cause which induced Brutus to depart from the ancestorial custom. The cause that Cicena assigns for Brutus's non-observance of this ancient institution was his ignorance of its obligation. But it does not seem to me likely that Brutus would have so rashly neglected an institution of our ancestors, for he was, close bracket, a learned man, and a great friend of Axius. I therefore conclude that Brutus considered December to be the last month in the year, as the ancients did February, which was so called when the institution was originated. He likewise conceived that it was a part of piety to offer the most important victims. With regard to the rite of sepulture, it is so sacred a thing that all confess it should be discharged in consecrated ground, and, if possible, in the land belonging to the family. Thus, in the times of our ancestors, Torquatus decided respecting the Popelian family, and certainly the Denicale feasts, so called from the Latin words de neque, implying deliverance from death, would not have been appointed as holidays in honor of the dead, as well as other celestials, unless our ancestors, who have departed this life, were believed to have passed into the number of deified beings. The privilege of fixing these among those when there are no peculiar festivals or public holidays, and the whole composition of the pontifical law on this subject proves the great sanctity and importance of this religious custom, and of these ceremonials. It is unnecessary for us at present to explain the proceedings of families in funeral ceremonies. What kind of sacrifice should be offered to the lares from the rams of the flock? How the bone, which remains unconsumed, must be covered with earth? How in some cases it is necessary to sacrifice a sow? when the sepulchre is to be considered as consecrated, and such minute details. 
it appears to me however that the kind of sepulture which cyrus according to xenophon solicited for himself is the most ancient of all for it is a kind of restitution which we make to the earth of a body which as a mother she produced and as a mother takes back to her protecting bosom in the same manner we are told that our ancient king numa was interred in that sepulchre which is near the altar of the fountain and we know that the cornelian family has likewise used this form of burial till a period within our own recollection the conqueror Sila, however ordered the corpse of marius to be disinterred from his grave on the banks of the anio impelled to this barbarous brutality by an implacable resentment which he would not have indulged if he had been as wise as he was vehement perhaps it was through fear that the same accident might happen to himself that he ordered that his body should be burned after his death a custom he was the first to introduce in the patrician family of the corneli for in the epitaph of scipio africanus ennius says here lies the body etc and the word lies is only applied in this way to them who are buried in sepulchres though perhaps tombs should not be entitled sepulchres till the last rites have been consummated and the corpse consumed by fire the verb to inhume which is now commonly applied to the burial of the deceased is most appropriate to those corpses that are interred after being burned the pontifical law proves this usage for before the ground is thrown over them the spot where the body is burned has no religious reverence attached to it when the earth is thrown over the corpse then it is inhumed and the tomb is called a sepulchre and many religious rites are performed in order to consecrate it so publius mucius determined with regard to a person who had been killed in a ship and then cast into the sea that his family was pure from any charge of neglect to the deceased inasmuch as no bone remained on the earth in which case his heir must have sacrificed a sow to his manes if on the contrary a bone had remained on the earth he considered that fasts should have been appointed to last three days and that a sow should likewise have been sacrificed if the deceased had died in the sea and all the same ceremonies should have been observed with the exception of the expiation and the holidays atticus i am well aware of these rules of the pontifical statutes but what do our civil laws say marcus little enough on this subject my atticus and nothing which i do not suppose that you are acquainted with already and what they say has less regard to the religious ceremonials than to the rites of sepulchres a law of the twelve tables orders that a dead person shall neither be buried nor burned within the city i suppose on account of the danger of fire but the addition of this expression nor burned indicates that the corpse which is burned is not so properly said to be buried as one which is put underground atticus how is it that notwithstanding this law of the twelve tables so many of our great men have been buried in the city marcus i believe my atticus that those who have been so buried have been either those to whom this privilege was granted before the law was made such as publicola and tubertus on account of their virtue and that their descendants have rightfully succeeded to it or those who like gaius fabricius have been discharged of their obligations to this law because of their virtue but the civil law does forbid burials in the city and in the same spirit the pontifical college has decreed that it is unlawful to raise a sepulchre in the public places 
you know the temple of honour outside the collinian gate we learn from tradition that there was in ancient times an altar on the spot and it appears from a medal discovered there on which was inscribed quote, the mistress of honour and this was the reason why that temple was so dedicated but as there were many sepulchres in the neighbourhood they were ploughed up when the city was enlarged for the pontifical college ordained that public places could not be bound by private consecrations another provision we find in the twelve tables intended to obviate the superfluous expenses and extravagant mournings at funerals almost literally translated from the laws of solon quote, never carve or polish a funeral pile close quote you recollect what follows for we learned the twelve tables when schoolboys as an indispensable lesson which however no one learns now let extravagance therefore be diminished to three suits of mourning with purple bands and ten flute players excessive lamentations are also to be prohibited by this rule quote, let not the women tear their cheeks or make the lessus or funeral wailings Close quote. those ancient interpreters of our laws sextus aelius and lucius achilius have said they could not understand this regulation but that they suspected it referred to some peculiar funeral ceremonials aelius defined the word quotes, lesus to be a kind of lugubrious ejaculation or shriek which i think likely enough since solon's law likewise forbids such lamentations these rules are very commendable and equally practicable by the rich and poor and they are eminently conformable to nature who sweeps away by mortality all the distinctions of fortune the twelve tables have likewise abridged those other funeral pomps which tend to augment sorrow for they thus declare quote, do not collect the bones of the dead when their funerals are over Close quote. an exception is made with regard to those who die in battle or in a foreign land besides these laws there are others with regard to unction which forbid a servile embalmment of the corpse and all kinds of funeral banquets which are justly abrogated but which would not have been so had they not been abuses quote, there shall likewise be no expensive respersions no large crowns or censers of perfume Close quote. it is certain however that the ornaments gained by merit do belong to the dead because the law enjoins that such a crown should be placed on the deceased who has deserved it by his virtue and on his nearest relation without any wrong being done thereby and because i suppose it had got to be a custom that many funeral ceremonies were celebrated for one man or many funeral processions arranged for any one deceased and since in the law there was this clause that gold should not be buried with the dead how humane is the exception made by another law that if the teeth of the deceased were fastened with gold the corpse might be buried or burned without taking it away and no wrong be done from which expression we might deduce another argument that burial and burning were considered different things besides these there are two laws respecting sepulchres one of which relates to the houses of private persons and the other to the family vaults themselves for one prohibits the erection of a funeral pile or pyre nearer than sixty feet to a neighbour's house without its proprietor's consent for fear of conflagration the other ordained that the sepulchre and its vestibule should not be subject to use a caption and thus defends the rights of sepulchres these regulations we find in the twelve tables and indeed they are very conformable to nature 
which is the principle of law the other portion relates to customs how funerals should be announced whether any games should be allowed whether the master of the ceremonies shall employ a herald and lictors it permits the praises of the honourable dead to be commemorated in a panegyric and accompanied by songs to the music of flutes of which dirges are called ninii a name which the greeks gave also to funeral lamentations quintus i am delighted that our laws are conformable to nature and i am above measure pleased with the wisdom of our ancestors marcus yet i believe my quintus that as in the case of other expenses so a moderation in those of funeral pomps and ceremonials is very properly required for you may see in the funeral of figulus to what an excess these extravagances were carried but i think that there was formerly far less ambition for this kind of extravagance than at present prevails otherwise there would be many examples of it in the records of our ancestors and indeed the interpreters of our law understand that in the chapter of the law which forbids profuse and excessive mourning and expense in honour of the manes the superfluous magnificence of sepulchres is also especially commanded to be curtailed nor has this important subject escaped the attention of the wisest legislators for they say that the custom of interring the dead in the greek mode has continued at athens ever since the time of cecrops and that immediately after such interments the next relatives when they had cast the earth over the dead scattered the seeds of vegetables over the spot in order that the earth might like a mother take her lifeless son to her bosom and then by the expiation of seed might again be restored to the living then followed a banquet which the relatives attended crowned with flowers and at this banquet they pronounced eulogiums on the deceased when anything could be truly said in his favour for it was reckoned impious to lie on such occasions and thus the ceremony terminated in process of time as demetrius phalereus assures us the funerals began to become sumptuous and the mourning lamentations were extravagantly multiplied these abuses were prohibited by solon's law which our decemvirs have translated almost word for word in our twelve tables for our rule respecting the three suits of mourning and other customs were thus derived from solon's regulation and that edict respecting the mourning is expressed in his precise words quote, let not the women tear their cheeks nor indulge their wailing at funerals Close quote. in solon's law respecting funerals there are no further directions than that he forbids any one injuring sepulchres and all introduction of any other body into them he makes it penal for any one to violate throw down or break any tomb for that is what i suppose he means by timbos or funeral monument or column but after a short time the extravagance of the mausoleums which we see built in the karamakos and cemetery gave occasion to that law which prohibits private persons from erecting any sepulchre more elaborate than ten men can construct in three days and even those it was not permitted to adorn with sculpture nor to place the statues they call mercuries around them nor to pronounce any panegyric of the dead excepting in the case of a public funeral nor might such panegyric be delivered by any one else except the man who was publicly appointed to perform that duty eulogiums of men and women were likewise forbidden that the lamentations might be diminished for such collections of people on melancholy occasions tend to augment unavailing sorrow on which account pitacus expressly forbade any one from attending the funerals of those that were strangers to him but the same demetrius also informs us 
that the magnificence of funeral processions and ceremonials grew to such a height as nearly to equal our fashions at present existing at rome these demetrius restrained by a wholesome law for he was not only as you are aware a very learned man but a most experienced citizen devoted to the preservation of the state he therefore diminished the expense of funerals not only by penalties but by a limitation of time as he commanded that they should be performed before sunrise he also established a rule of moderation for all new sepulchres for he would not allow any erection on the mound of earth save a little column three cubits high or a tombstone or tablet and he appointed a regular magistrate to superintend these observances such my atticus were the laws enforced among your athenians but let us see what plato says who allots to the ministers of religion the charge of regulating funerals a custom which we also observe these are his words respecting sepulchres Quote, do not use as a burial place any portion of land which is either cultivated or which may be so but such a soil as by nature is only suitable for receiving the bodies of the dead without detriment to the interests of the living as to a field which is capable of bearing fruit and as a mother supplying us with food let no one by any means injure it whether he be living or dead and let no sepulchre be built to a greater elevation than five men can raise in five days nor let a tablet be made any larger than is required for the reception of an epitaph on the deceased in four heroic verses close quote, which ennius calls long verses we have therefore the authority of the illustrious plato also in our favour on the subject of sepulchres he likewise regulates the funeral expenses by the fortune of the family from one mina to five he then repeats what he had before said respecting the immortality of the soul and the tranquillity of the good after death and the punishment of the wicked i have now i believe sufficiently explained all the laws which relate to religious rites quintus you have my brother and most copiously too but now proceed to the other branch of our subject marcus it is my intention to do so and since you urge me to these discussions i will endeavour to bring our argument to a conclusion and if possible in the course of the day for i find that plato did the same and that the whole of his disquisition on the laws was completed in one summer day i will therefore try to imitate him and will next speak of magistrates for after religion is once established that is the part of the next greatest importance with reference to keeping together the republic atticus proceed then and preserve the same method in which you have begun end of book two book three of on the laws by marcus tullius cicero translated by charles duke young book three introduction to the third book in this third book cicero treats of the civil laws and the offices and duties of the civil magistrates by whom they are enforced on these topics he lays down a series of legal maxims and then proceeds to give an ample exposition of their several provisions marcus i shall therefore imitate that divine man who has inspired me with such admiration that i eulogize him perhaps oftener than is necessary atticus you mean plato marcus the very man my atticus atticus indeed you do not exaggerate your compliments nor bestow them too frequently for even my epicurean friends who do not like any one to be praised but their own master still allow me to love plato as much as i like marcus 
they do well to grant you this indulgence for what can be so suitable to the elegance of your taste as the writings of plato who in his life and manners appears to me to have succeeded in that most difficult combination of gravity and politeness atticus i am glad i interrupted you since you have availed yourself of an opportunity of giving this splendid testimonial of your judgment respecting him but pursue the subject as you began marcus let us begin then with praising the law itself with those commendations which are both deserved and appropriate to the subject atticus that is but fair since you did the same in the case of our ecclesiastical jurisprudence marcus you see then that this is the duty of magistrates to superintend and prescribe all things which are just and useful and in accordance with the law for as the law is set over the magistrate even so are the magistrates set over the people and therefore it may be truly said quote, that the magistrate is a speaking law and the law a silent magistrate Close quote. moreover nothing is so conformable to justice and to the condition of nature and when i use that expression i wish it to be understood that i mean the law and nothing else as sovereign power without which neither house nor commonwealth nor nation nor mankind itself nor the entire nature of things nor the universe itself could exist for this universe is obedient to god and land and sea are submissive to the universe and human life depends on the just administration of the laws of order but to come to considerations nearer home and more familiar to us all ancient nations have been at one time or other under the dominion of kings which kind of authority was at first conferred on the wisest and justest men and this rule mainly prevailed in our own commonwealth as long as the regal power lasted afterward the authority of kings was handed down in succession to their descendants and this practice remains to this day in those which are governed by kings and even those to whom the regal domination was distasteful did not desire to be obedient to no one but only not to be always under the authority of the same person for ourselves then as we are proposing laws for a free people and as we have already set forth in six books all our own opinions about the best kind of commonwealth we shall on the present occasion endeavour to accommodate our laws to that constitutional government of which we have expressed our approval it is clear then that magistrates are absolutely necessary since without their prudence and diligence a state cannot exist and since it is by their regulations that the whole commonwealth is kept within the bounds of moderation but it is not enough to prescribe them a rule of domination unless we likewise prescribe the citizens a rule of obedience for he who commands well must at some time or other have obeyed and he who obeys with modesty appears worthy of some day or other being allowed to command it is desirable therefore that he who obeys should expect that some day he will come to command and that he who commands should bear in mind that ere long he may be called to the duty of submission we would not however limit ourselves to requiring from the citizens submission and obedience towards their magistrates we would also enjoin them by all means to honour and love their rulers as charondas prescribes in his code our plato likewise declares that they are of the race of the titans who as they rebelled against the heavenly deities do in like manner oppose their magistrates these points being granted we will if you please advance to the examination of the laws themselves atticus i certainly do please 
and the arrangement seems advisable. Marcus. Quote, let all authorities be just, and let them be honestly obeyed by the people with modesty and without opposition. Let the magistrate restrain the disobedient and mischievous citizen by fine, imprisonment, and corporal chastisement, unless some equal or greater power or the people forbid it, for there should be an appeal thereto. If the magistrate shall have decided and inflicted a penalty, let there be a public appeal to the people respecting the penalty and fine imposed. Quote, With respect to the army and the general that commands it by martial law, there should be no appeal from his authority, and whatever he who conducts the war commands shall be absolute law and ratified as such. Quote, as to the minor magistrates, let there be such a distribution of their legal duties that each may more effectively superintend his own department of justice. In the army let those who are appointed command, and let them have tribunes. In the city let men be appointed as superintendents of the public treasury. Let some devote their attention to the prison discipline and capital punishments, let others supervise the public coinage of gold and silver and copper. Let others judge of suits and arbitrations, and let others carry the orders of the Senate into execution. Quote, let there likewise be ediles, curators of the city, the provisions, and the public games, and let these offices be the first steps to higher promotions of honor. Quote, let the censors take a census of the people according to age, offspring, family, and property. Let them have the inspection of the temples, the streets, the aqueducts, the rates, and the customs. Let them distribute the citizens according to their tribes. After that, let them divide them with reference to their fortunes, ages, and ranks. Let them keep a register of the families of those of the equestrian and plebeian orders. Let them impose a tax on celibates. Let them guard the morals of the people. Let them permit no scandal in the Senate. Let the number of such censors be two. Let their magistracy continue five years. Let the other magistrates be annual, but their offices themselves should be perpetual. Quote, let the judge of the law who shall decide private actions or send them for decision to the praetor, let him be the proper guardian of civil jurisprudence. Let him have as many colleagues of equal power as the Senate think necessary, and the people allows him. Quote, let two magistrates be invested with sovereign authority from their presiding, judging, and counselling, let them be called praetors, judges, or consuls. Let them have supreme authority over the army, and let them be subject to none, for the safety of the people is the supreme law, and no one should succeed to this magistracy till it has been held ten years, regulating the duration by an annual law. Quote, when a considerable war is undertaken, or discord is likely to ensue among the citizens, let a single supreme magistrate be appointed, who shall unite in his own person the authority of both consuls, if the Senate so decrees, for six months only. And when such a magistrate has been proclaimed under favorable auspices, let him be the master of the people." Let him have for a colleague with equal powers with himself a knight whomsoever he may choose to appoint as a judge of the law, and when such a dictator or master of the people is created, the other magistracies shall be suppressed. Quote, let the auspices be observed by the Senate, and let them authorize persons of their own body to elect the consuls in the comitia according to the established ceremonials. Quote, 
let the commanders generals and lieutenants leave the city whenever the senate decrees or the people orders that they shall do so let them properly prosecute all just wars let them spare our allies and restrain themselves and their subordinates let them increase the glory of our country let them return home with honour let no one be made an ambassador with a view to his own interest Quote, let the ten officers whom the people elect to protect them against oppression be their tribunes and let all their prohibitions and adjudications be established and their persons considered inviolable so that tribunes may never be wanting to the people Quote, let all magistrates possess their auspices and jurisdictions and let the senate be composed of these legitimate authorities let its ordinances be absolute and let its enactments be written and ratified unless an equal or greater authority disannul them let the order of the senators be free from reproach and scandal and let them be an example of virtue to all Quote, in the creation of magistrates the judgment of the accused and the reception or rejection of laws when suffrages are employed let the suffrages be at once notorious to the nobles and free to the people Quote, if any question occur out of the established jurisdiction of the magistrates let another magistrate be appointed by the people whose jurisdiction shall expressly extend thereto let the consul the praetor the censor the master of the people and of the knights and he to whom the senate has committed the election of consuls have full liberty to treat both with the senate and the people and endeavour to reconcile the interests of all parties let the tribunes of the people likewise have free access to the senate and advocate the interests of the people in all their deliberations let a just moderation predominate in the opinions and declarations of those who would thus act as mediators between the senate and the people let a senator who does not attend the senate either show cause of his non-attendance or submit to an appropriate fine let a senator speak in his turn with all moderation and let him be thoroughly acquainted with the interests of the people Quote, by all means avoid violence among the people let the greatest authority have the greatest weight in decisions if any one shall disturb the public harmony and foment party quarrels let him be punished as a criminal to act the intercessor in cases of offence should be considered the part of a good citizen let those who act observe the auspices obey the public augur and carry into effect all proclamations taking care that they are exhibited in the treasury and generally known let the public consultations be concentrated in one point at a time let them instruct the people in the nature of the question and let all the magistrates and the people be permitted to advise on the subject Quote, let them permit no monopolies or privileges with respect to the capital punishment of any citizen let it not take place unless by the adjudication of the high courts of justice and the ministry of those whom the censors have placed over the popular orders let no bribes be given or received either in soliciting discharging or resigning an official situation Quote, if any one shall infringe any of these laws let him be liable to a penalty let these regulations be committed to the charge of the censors let public officers on their retiring from their posts give these censors an account of their conduct but let them not by this means escape from legal prosecution if they have been guilty of corruption Close quote. i have here recited the whole law now consider the question and give your votes
quintus with what conciseness my brother have you brought before our eyes the duties and offices of all magistrates but your system of laws is almost that of our own commonwealth although a little that is new has also been added by you marcus your observation is very just my quintus for this is the very system of a commonwealth which scipio eulogizes in my treatise and which he mainly approves and which cannot be kept in operation but by a successive order of magistrates such as we have described for you may take it for granted that it is the establishment of magistrates that gives its form to a commonwealth and it is exactly by their distribution and subordination that we must determine the nature of the constitution which establishment being very wisely and discreetly settled by our ancestors there is nothing or at all events very little alteration that i think necessary in the laws atticus tell us then as you did at my request respecting the ecclesiastical laws so also now in regard to these magisterial and civil laws the reasons why you prefer the maxims you have stated marcus i will do as you desire my atticus and i will explain how much of this topic has been investigated and illustrated by the disputations of the most learned philosophers of greece and then as i proposed at first i will touch on your own laws atticus i am impatient to hear this dissertation of yours marcus and indeed i have already stated a large part of the doctrines relating to this inquiry in the books which i composed respecting the best sort of commonwealth on this topic however there have been some peculiar questions with respect to the duties and offices of magistrates treated with considerable subtlety first by theophrastus and next by dion the stoic atticus a stoic say you were such questions ever discussed by the stoics marcus certainly not with the exception of the philosopher i have just cited and after him of panetios a great man and one of singular erudition indeed the ancient stoics were not so deficient in their speculative dissertations respecting politics and laws as they were in the practical application of them to the service of the people the greatest light was shed on this part of the subject by this school under the guidance of plato afterwards aristotle illustrated all matters of civil jurisprudence in his elaborate essays as did also heraclides of pontos another of plato's disciples and theophrastus who was instructed by aristotle was wholly devoted as you are aware to disquisitions of this kind and dicercos a disciple of the same master was by no means deficient in the principles of this science after these demetrios phalereus before mentioned drew legal learning by his admirable talents from the shade and inactivity of the schools into the open daylight of civil life and gave it a practical point and efficacy which are of the greatest service in all critical emergencies and conflicts for we often find that men of the greatest weight in the republic are deficient in philosophy and that those who are very learned in philosophy are remarkably ignorant in legal affairs and i hardly know where we could find any besides him who has excelled both in the theory and practice of jurisprudence so as to be at once a prince of learning and of political economy atticus i think i could show you such a man and one of us three too but pray continue your discourse as you have begun marcus these greek philosophers made it a grand point of inquiry whether one magistrate should be appointed in each commonwealth to whom all the rest should be subordinate which system as i understand was what was decided on by our ancestors after the expulsion of the kings 
but since the monarchical constitution which was at first preferred was changed not so much through any fault in the monarchy as through the vices of a monarch it should seem that the monarchy itself still subsists and that nothing but the name of king has been repudiated if one magistrate is still to have authority over all the rest it was not without reason therefore that theopompus in lacedaemon qualified the power of the spartan kings by the ephori or that we romans qualify the power of our consuls by tribunes for our consuls are invested with such authority by law that they command all the other magistrates except the tribunes who were created some time after in order to hinder those events from recurring which had taken place before for the first diminution of the power of the consuls was the creation of a magistrate who was not subject to it the next was when this new magistrate gave his aid not only to other magistrates but even to private citizens who refused obedience to the consuls quintus you speak of a great evil for since the office of the tribunes of the people was established the authority of the nobles has declined and the rule of the mob has gained strength marcus the case is not quite so bad as you think my quintus for that power of the consuls inevitably appeared to the people not only something too arrogant but also too violent but since wise and moderate limitation has been imposed upon it it diffuses law and justice to all the citizens footnote there is a great hiatus here in the latin text i do not know whence mr barham has derived the sentence within brackets End footnote. bracket let us now come to the exposition of our legal maxims before stated and to pass over that earlier portion whose propriety is almost self-evident let us notice that maxim which declares that soldiers should endeavour to return close bracket, home with unblemished honour for to good and innocent men no prize so valuable as honour can be derived either from our enemies or our friends that maxim is also plainly just that nothing can be baser than for a man to sue for an appointment as a legate for any other interest than that of his country i say nothing of how those men conduct and have conducted themselves who in their office of legate pursue inheritances for themselves and bonds and deeds this is a fault which must perhaps exist in mankind but i ask if anything could be more scandalous than to see senators without commissions and legates without instructions or any public business of a patriotic kind this sort of legation i should have abolished when consul with the approbation of a full senate though apparently its continuance would have been for the interest of the senate had not a certain capricious tribune of the people opposed me i succeeded however in shortening the duration of such and what was of great importance made such appointments merely annual and thus though the scandal still remains it has lost its perpetuity but now if you please we will quit the provinces and once more return to rome atticus it pleases me certainly but it would not at all please those who are in the provinces marcus but if they my atticus were content to obey the just laws of their country they would like nothing better than rome and their roman villas and would hold nothing more laborious and troublesome than their provincial appointments a law follows which confirms to the tribunes of the people the power they possess in our commonwealth on which i need not enlarge quintus i beg your pardon my brother but i particularly wish to know your opinion of this power of the tribunes to me it appears extremely mischievous at once the child and parent of endless seditions if we look back to the origin of the tribunate 
we find that it originally sprang up at a time of civil disturbances when all the chief places of the city were either occupied or besieged after this being soon stifled as one of those monstrous abortions which by a law of the twelve tables are not suffered to live it again recovered its existence only to become baser and viler than ever for what kind of atrocity did it leave undone its first act was a piece of villainy well worthy of its impious character namely the abrogation of the honours of the senate and patricians it reduced the highest ranks to an equality with the meanest agitating and confounding all things when it had thus insulted and violated the gravity of our nobles it was still as insane and insensate as before not to mention a flaminius and others which you may call antiquated instances what laws or rights did the tribune tiberius gracchus leave to the best and worthiest citizens and five years before did not the tribune caius curiatius the basest and foulest of mortals cast into prison the consuls decimus brutus and publius scipio men of the greatest eminence a thing which was wholly unprecedented and did not caius gracchus endeavour to overturn and revolutionize our whole commonwealth by throwing darts and daggers into the forum as he himself avowed in order to excite the citizens to mutual slaughter as if they were so many gladiators why need i speak of the crimes of saturninus and others whose violences the commonwealth could scarcely repel without civil war but why should we mention these antique instances belonging to other ages when so many have occurred within our own memory who was ever so audacious and so inimical to us as to nourish a thought of destroying our state without he had first sharpened some sword of a tribune against us and when infamous and profligate men could not find not only in any house but not even in any nation any such instrument they endeavoured to create disturbances among the people in the darkest places of the republic and what does us infinite honour and secures us immortal renown is the fact that no tribune could be engaged to appear against us by any bribe whatever except that one who could not legally be a tribune at all who used the tribunate as a cloak of villainy as for this monster what crimes did he not perpetrate crimes which without reason or plausible hope he committed with the fury of some savage beast maddened with the violence of the brutal mob i therefore highly approve of the conduct of sulla in this particular inasmuch as by his law he rendered the tribunes of the people comparatively impotent for mischief though he left them the power of giving assistance as for our friend pompey in all other respects i extol him with the amplest and warmest praises i say nothing of his views relating to the power of the tribunes for here i cannot praise him and yet i would not censure him marcus you have very clearly unfolded my quintus the defects and abuses of the tribunate but it is unfair with respect to any matter which one is impeaching to state all its faults dwell upon all its evils and omit its merits for in this way you might make out the consulate itself to be a very culpable and objectionable institution if you were to reckon up all the sins of some consuls whom i am willing to pass in silence for even in this power i confess there are some stains of evil but we can never obtain the good which we aimed at in its establishment without those particles of evil that the authority of the tribunes of the people is too great none will deny but the power of the people themselves is much more cruel and much more violent and by having a leader therefore such as a tribune they often behave more temperately 
than if they had no one at all for a leader remembers that he is advancing at his own risk whereas the violence of the people has no consideration for its own danger sometimes it is suddenly excited and again it is often tranquillized for what body of men can be so insane that not one in ten of its members preserves his senses and as to tiberius gracchus himself his power was destroyed by preventing his colleague from acting and then deposing him for what else was it that ruined him but the fact of his having deprived his colleague of the power of interposing his veto in this matter however observe the wisdom of our ancestors when this office of tribuneship was granted by the senate to the people war ceased seditions were extinguished and that wholesome liberty was secured by which meritorious commoners think themselves placed on a level with the chief men of the state which is one great principle of the welfare of the state but there were two gracchi yes and besides them whatever number you may choose to enumerate you will find it to be the case as ten are created that at all times some have been mischievous and still more capricious and far from virtuous the highest order of the state is indeed far above envy and the people never enter into perilous contentions concerning their rights therefore we must acknowledge either that the expulsion of our kings was unnecessary or that liberty of the people must be guaranteed in fact as well as in profession and as it is their liberty is such that they have been obliged to sue for the protection of many most illustrious men and compelled to yield to the authority of the senate in regard to our private cause my best and dearest brother though it fell under the tribunicial power we had no contention with the tribuneship for it was not the people who had been stirred up to wish to injure us but a pack of miscreants whom they let out of prison on purpose to attack us and reprobate slaves and the terror of the soldiery too was added and to confess the truth we had less to struggle against in our private enemies than in the grievous disorders of the state and if i had not yielded in some measure to the tempest my country would not now enjoy the continued benefit of my services and this the event testified for what free man is there or what slave worthy of emancipation to whom our escape was not a subject of congratulation but if all the labours which i underwent on behalf of the safety of the commonwealth had been so unfortunate as not to give universal satisfaction if the rage of an infuriated mob had driven me away by the hurricane of their evil passions if some tribune had stirred up the populace against me as gracchus did against linus and saturninus against metellus i should still have borne it my quintus with fortitude and have been comforted not less by the counsel of the philosophers of athens who ought to have this power than by the example of the illustrious men who having been expelled from their country have preferred losing an ungrateful city than remaining in a wicked one but when you say that in this one point you do not greatly approve of the conduct of pompey you scarcely seem to me sufficiently to recollect that he had to consider not only what was best but also what was necessary for he knew that a certain share of civic authority must needs be granted to the citizens which as the people so ardently desired before they attained it they would be especially loath to relinquish when once acquired it was therefore the part of a wise statesman not to refuse a privilege to the people which was not essentially mischievous and which also was so highly popular that it could not be denied you know my brother that in discourses of this kind it is customary to express your assent in order that the speaker may pass on to another branch of the subject atticus exactly so quintus 
i do not entirely agree with you respecting pompey but still i should like you to go on to the remainder of the subject marcus do you then still persist in and abide by your former opinion quintus i do at present atticus i however disagree with my friend quintus but let us by all means hear what remains more to be said marcus the following maxim allots to all magistrates their auspices and jurisdictions their jurisdictions in such a manner that there should still be a supreme court of justice to which appeals may be made by the people and the auspices in order that there may be furnished a plausible method of adjourning useless or mischievous assemblies for in this way it has often happened that the gods have suppressed by means of auspices the unjust impetuosity of the mob again the law that the senate shall be composed of those who have exercised magistracies is undoubtedly one for the interest of the people since it permits none to arrive at high authority without the approbation of the people taking away the power of appointment from the censors but by way of moderating this effect which might be a pernicious one another provision immediately follows by which the authority of the senate is confirmed for the words are these let the decrees of the senate be ratified as laws for the whole result is that if it so happen that the senate becomes the master of public politics and if all men defend whatever it decrees and if all the other orders agree that the commonwealth shall be governed by this superior order there will arise from this amalgamation of rights when the power is in the people and the authority in the senate that modified and harmonious kind of constitution which i have so highly extolled especially if the following law be also observed for the next law is quote, let the senatorial order be free from corruption and let it be a pattern to others Close quote. quintus an admirable law that is my brother and one of extensive application to the end that this order be free from corruption and have a censor for its interpreter atticus but although the senatorial order is wholly devoted to your interests my marcus and retains a most grateful recollection of your consulship i would say if you will give me leave that it would be enough to weary not only the censors but all the judges also marcus but let us leave this question for the present my atticus for our present business is not so much with the senate of to-day nor with the statesmen who exist at this moment as with future generations if any of them are willing to obey these laws for as the law enjoins that the senatorial order shall be exempt from all corruption no one who is tainted with any vice will even seek to enter that order and that is an event most difficult to be realized except by a certain education and discipline on which we may perhaps say something if there should arise a suitable place and opportunity atticus a suitable place will certainly not be wanting since you are now laying down a system of laws and as to time the length of the days at present will give you that but even if you omit this topic now i shall at a future time demand your views on education and discipline marcus you shall have them my atticus on that topic and on any other which i may have omitted i will therefore enlarge a little on this legal maxim before cited quote, let the senator be a pattern to others Close quote. if this is observed all will go well for as a whole city is infected by the licentious passions and vices of great men so it is often reformed by their virtue and moderation lucius lucullus a great man and a great friend of all of us being rallied for the magnificence of his seat at tusculum is said to have made the following extremely suitable answer 
that he had two neighbours the greater of whom was only a roman knight and the other a freedman and as each of them had magnificent villas that could not be thought extravagance in himself a consul which was lawful for those of inferior rank but do not you see lucullus that it was owing to you that they had these desires had it not been for your example such an action in them would have been looked on as criminal for who would have borne people of this sort when he saw their villas crowded with statues and pictures relating either to public or what is more to sacred and religious subjects who would not have joined in demolishing the monuments of their vanity and pride if those who ought to exert themselves on such occasions were not guilty of the same extravagance for it is not so great an evil that the chiefs of the city should do wrong though that must be allowed to be very considerable of itself as the fact that there are a great many imitators of those chiefs would you but look into the history of former ages you might plainly see that such as the chief men of the state have been such has also been the state in general and that whatever change of manners took place in the former the same always followed it in the latter now this observation is much more certain than that of plato who pretends that a change in the songs of musicians is able to alter the manners of a nation whereas my opinion is that the manners of the people in general change with the manners and fashions of the nobles on which account great men of a vicious life are doubly pernicious to the state as being not only guilty of immoral practices themselves but likewise of spreading them far and wide among their fellow-citizens nor are they mischievous to it inasmuch as they cherish vices themselves but also because they corrupt others and they do more harm by their example than by the crimes which they commit and this maxim though we would wish to extend its influence to the whole body of senators may also be contracted for even a few ay even a very few men illustrious in fame and fortune may either corrupt or correct the manners of the state but we have said enough on this topic not only now but also in those other books of ours let us therefore proceed to what follows the next law relates to suffrages and votes which as i have said should be notorious to the nobles and free to the people atticus i have given much attention to this maxim but i do not well understand its spirit or its exact meaning marcus i will tell you my atticus and we shall have now to treat on a very difficult question and one which has already been much and repeatedly discussed the question namely whether in case of suffrages at the election of magistrates or in the trial of criminals or in the enacting of laws it is better that the votes should be given openly by poll or secretly by ballot atticus is it indeed a doubtful question quintus i fear we shall again differ in opinion marcus i do not think so my quintus for here i hold that doctrine which i know you always maintained that in giving suffrages and votes nothing can be better than an open viva voce declaration but whether that can be obtained is a question to be examined quintus if you will excuse me my brother i should say that that opinion which you here imply is one which greatly misleads the inexperienced and which is also often hurtful to the state i mean that which pronounces a regulation true and proper in itself but at the same time asserts that it cannot be obtained because it cannot be carried without opposing the people for i say in the first place that the people ought to be opposed whenever strict propriety requires it and secondly that it is better to be oppressed by violence in a good cause than to yield to a bad one now who does not perceive that all authority has been taken away from the nobility by the present law of balloting 
a law which the people when free never desired but which they claimed when oppressed by the domination and power of the chief men of the state therefore those judgments which are passed upon the most powerful men of the state by viva voce votes are more frequent than those which are given by ballot therefore it had been far better to have restrained the excessive influence of the great for unjustifiable objects in elective suffrages than to have given the people a mask and veil by which while the more honourable citizens were kept in ignorance of their individual sentiments they might thus make the ballot a mere cover for corrupt and hypocritical votes for this reason it is that no good man was ever a proposer or supporter of the system of balloting for there are four laws of ballots the first of which concerning the election of magistrates was proposed by a certain gabinius an unknown and sordid agitator the second respecting the adjudications of the people was proposed two years afterwards by cassius who was a noble man but without meaning any offence to his family i venture to say a noble man at variance with all good men and one who was driven to and fro by the idlest rumours of the populace the third regarding the ratification and nullification of laws was carried by carpo a seditious and profligate citizen whose return to the better classes of society never secured him the approbation of those better classes there remained only the crime of treason which cassius himself accepted in the judgment of which open viva voce votes were permitted but coelius soon after thought proper to give traitors also the chance of the ballot but as long as he lived he repented of having injured the republic for the purpose of oppressing caius popilius our grandfather a man of singular virtue in this town of arpinum as long as he lived opposed gratidius whose sister our grandmother he had married when he wanted to introduce the law of ballot for gratidius was raising a storm in a ladle as the proverb is as his son marius afterwards did in the aegean sea to such a length did the quarrel proceed that the consul scaurus when he was informed of what had happened made this remark to our grandfather quote, would to heaven cicero that a man of your courage and honour had better loved to live in the capital of our commonwealth than to bury yourself in a municipal town Close quote. therefore since our design is not so much to give a regular list of the roman laws but rather to revive those good laws that have become obsolete and to propose new regulations i do not think that we ought here to discuss what can be obtained by our people but what is the best for your friend scipio bears all the responsibility of the cassian law and indeed he is said to have been its original promoter and if you pass a law of ballot you will incur a similar responsibility for in truth i do not like it at all nor does our friend atticus either if i may judge by his countenance atticus for me i never admired anything that pleased the mob and i regard that as the best state of the commonwealth which our friend here when consul promoted when the chief power in the hands of the aristocracy prevailed over that of the populace marcus i see that you would repeal my law respecting suffrages without any ballot whatsoever but for myself though in those books of mine scipio has said quite enough in his own behalf i am nevertheless willing to grant so much liberty to the people as will leave virtuous citizens in possession of and at liberty to exert their due influence for these are the very words of my law respecting elections quote, let the votes be notorious to the nobles and free to the people which law was meant to have the effect of abrogating all those laws which were passed subsequently and which in any way mask or conceal the vote 
such as those which hinder full inspection of any ballot or examination and appeal thereupon and that law of marius which makes the passages to the hustings narrow if these rules are opposed as they generally are to the ambitious i do not find fault with them and indeed if they could but hinder canvassing and intrigue then the people might be allowed the ballot as a vindicator of liberty provided it were so laid open and freely exposed to all honourable and worthy citizens that their authority might be blended with this popular privilege thus leaving the people the power of expressing their deference for the aristocracy but why is it quintus as you just now observed that there were more condemnations passed by the open suffrages of the poll than by the silent secret votes of the ballot it is because the people are contented with having the power and if this be preserved to them then they give up everything else to influence or popularity and therefore to pass over those votes which are corruptly given for bribes do you not see if we could but get rid of canvassing the question in giving votes would be what are the wishes and opinions of the best men by our law therefore the appearance of liberty is conceded the influence of the aristocracy is retained and the cause of contention banished the next law is one which relates to those magistrates whose right it is to treat with the senate and the people it is an important and as i think an admirable regulation that in every transaction with the people or with the senate the utmost moderation should be observed for the advocate of any measure regulates and moulds to his will not merely the opinions and inclinations but i may almost say the very features of his audience and this is not difficult in the senate however for the senator is not a man whose attention is wholly fixed upon his hearers but he rather desires to be considered on his own account we therefore require three duties from the senator first that his attendance in the senate be regular for the multitude of senators lends weight to the arguments of policy secondly that he should speak in his turn that is when his counsel is demanded thirdly that he should speak concisely lest he should become infinitely wearisome for brevity is the best recommendation of a speech not only in the case of a senator but in that too of an orator lengthy speeches therefore are never to be employed except when the senate is precipitating some rash measure as it does far too often through ambition it may be desirable for a speaker if there is no aid to be obtained from any magistrate to occupy a whole day or when the subject of debate is so important as to demand all the copiousness of the orator both in exhortation and explanation in both which kinds of oratory our friend cato is remarkably distinguished and as to the addition that he should uphold the interests of the people it is clearly necessary for a senator to be acquainted with the general state of the republic and this is a subject of very extensive application since it comprehends a knowledge of the military affairs the state of the treasury the foreign alliances the friends and stipendiaries of the republic an acquaintance with the regulations the resources and the engagements of each people a sufficient knowledge of the practices of deliberations to maintain them and a familiarity with the precedents of our ancestors you therefore see that the science of politics taxes every power of intellect diligence and memory in order to acquire and maintain that elaborate information without which no one can be called an accomplished senator the next law relates to the public deliberations of the people in which it is especially enjoined that all violence be avoided for nothing is more destructive in states nothing so contrary to law and right nothing less civil and humane than to carry anything by violence and agitation in a sound and constitutional government 
it commands that respect be paid to any magistrate who interposes his veto than which injunction nothing can be more admirable since it is better that a good measure be sometimes impeded than that a bad one should be carried when i say that in all cases of fraud it is necessary to go before a pleader i follow the opinion of crassus one of our wisest men whose counsel was adopted by the senate which decreed when the consul claudius made a motion respecting carpo's sedition that they could not take cognizance of sedition except through the medium of an official pleader who should lay the case before the people since it was allowable for him who made a proposition to abandon it as soon as it began to occasion disturbance while a man who persists when he can do no good is seeking for violence which is by this law deprived of all impunity then follows the law which states that he who acts as a preventer of evil measures by the interposition of his veto is a good citizen and who would not zealously come to the assistance of the commonwealth when stimulated by the hope of acquiring a character so glorious next succeed certain regulations which we likewise find in the public institutions and laws that the auspices be observed and the augurs obeyed it is the duty of a good augur to remember that it is his duty to stand by the republic at the time of its greatest emergency that he is appointed as the minister and prophet of the all-good and all-great jupiter just as those men are his to whom he has entrusted the auspices and that definite portions of the heavens are committed to him in order that by them he may often be able to succour the state in her hour of danger and necessity then follow provisions respecting the promulgation of laws respecting the proposing their successive counts and clauses separately and the duty of listening to the remonstrances and objections not of the magistrates only but of private individuals after this we find two excellent laws selected from the twelve tables one of which forbids unfair privileges the other will not permit sentence of death to be passed on any citizen except in the supreme court of the comitia centuriata it is a marvellous thing that before such magistrates as seditious tribunes of the people were known or ever thought of our ancestors should have provided so carefully for posterity they forbade laws to be enacted against particular individuals for that is what we call privilege than which nothing can be more inequitable since it is the plain meaning of the word law that what has been decreed should be equally enjoined to all and they refused to sanction any enactments respecting particular individuals which were not openly proposed in the centuriata comitia for when the people are summoned by rank order and age they use much more consideration in giving their suffrages than when they are promiscuously convoked by tribes it was therefore very truly observed in my own particular cause by lucius cotta a man of vast genius and consummate prudence that no sentence whatever had been legally pronounced against us for besides the fact that that comitia was held under the fear of an armed mob of slaves and comitia tributa could neither pass capital sentence nor any adjudications of privilege there was therefore no need of a law for the recall of a person against whom no sentence whatever had been legally pronounced but it appeared both to ourselves and to other most illustrious men to be more proper seeing that slaves and vagabonds persisted in declaring that they had passed some sentence upon me that all italy should manifest as openly as possible what it thought on the subject next follow those laws which relate to pecuniary bribes and canvassing and since these cannot be so well chastised by censures as by penalties it is added let all such abuses be visited with equivalent penalty and punishment so that every one may be duly punished for his fault violence being corrected by death avarice by fines and ambition 
by ignominy the last laws which we have cited are not in use among us though very necessary to the state we have no proper registration of laws our laws therefore are such as the apparitors declare them to be and we are forced to take the word of their copyists as our security we have no public legal registry in which our laws may lie open to the notice of the people the greeks are more careful than ourselves in this matter as they have instituted legal registrars whom they call nomophiliques their office is not only to preserve the original copies of the laws as was the custom among our ancestors but also to take notice of the conduct of men and to recall them to their obedience to the law this care may be entrusted to the censors since we wish at all times to maintain their functions in the state it is likewise to the censors according to our legal maxim that those who retire from magisterial offices should report and explain their proceedings when in office in order to enable the censors to pronounce upon them fairly this is done in greece by publicly constituted accusers who however could never have much weight unless their functions were voluntary and honorary it is therefore better that the case should be stated to and the accounts laid before the censors reserving intact all their rights to the accuser and the law but we have now sufficiently discussed the offices and duties of magistrates unless you demand further information on any point atticus why if we held our peace the very subject itself would admonish you what you ought further to say marcus would it i suppose you want me next to treat of judgments as that is a kindred subject to that of magistrates atticus what then do you think nothing remains to be said on the rights of the romans which you propose to investigate marcus what would you have me say on such a topic atticus i would have you treat of those regulations of which i think it most disgraceful to those who live in a republic to be ignorant for as you remarked just now i can only read our laws by favour of the copyists and so i observe that many of our magistrates are so ignorant of their own laws that they know no more about them than their clerks choose to tell them since therefore when you had proposed to explain the laws of religion you thought it became you to treat of the alienation of sacred things in like manner now that you have described the laws of our magistrates you must discuss their power and their rights marcus i will endeavour to do so briefly if i can for your father's friend marcus junius addressed to him a copious treatise on this subject which in my opinion is extremely well and ingeniously written but on the subject of the law of nature we ought to think to ourselves and to speak from our own hearts but when we are considering the rights of the roman people we must then repeat what has been bequeathed and handed down to us atticus such indeed appears to me the right method of proceeding and i shall listen with pleasure to all you may choose to say on these topics footnote how many books of this treatise originally existed is not known it is certain that there were five and davies thinks there were eight but we have nothing beyond the first three End footnote. fragments as one and the same universal nature unites and corroborates all the parts of the world so did she unite into one harmonious family all mankind but men through their depravity disagreed and quarrelled not recollecting that they are all consanguineous and akin and equally subject to the same paternal providence if this fact indeed were but kept in mind all men might live the amiable life of the gods it was a very bold and hazardous measure of the greek government to consecrate the images of love and cupid in the public theatres let us congratulate ourselves since death gives us something better than we enjoy in life and 
not a worse condition of things for that immortality may truly be termed divine wherein the mind flourishes emancipated from the body and being delivered from sensualism is free from evil end of on the laws by marcus tullius cicero translated by charles duke young read by geoffrey edwards meta coordinated by caroline proof listened by caillot